So, uh, Jameson, the myth that a lot of men believe, and I used to believe this myth big time, is that there is a difference in the, the range of testosterone. If you look at the reference range, right? So a lot of men, especially when they hit their you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, their testosterone starts dropping. And from the studies, we know that at the age of 30, testosterone drops by 1% every single year. Fair enough. But then there's this concept that if you are in the middle of testosterone, like in the middle of the reference range, let's say you are 25 years old and you are, let's say, 650 nanograms per deciliter. It might be somewhere around average to a little bit in, in, the, in the high range, right? This is from current reference ranges. If you look at the reference range 50 years ago, obviously it was very different. And we can get into that as well. But my question to you is, when you look at the reference range of testosterone, do you think it actually matters if you are at the high end of the reference range or the middle end of the refer reference range or you know in in the middle to high so let's say you let's say the reference range is from 300 nanograms per deciliter to 1200 nanograms per deciliter okay and let's say you are around 700 650 to 700 so you're not low t you're kind of average t now let's say you went from 650 to 700 and now you climb to 900 let's say you took uh tonkat ali uh, you took some supplement, you, um, you, you, you know, exercise, you slept well, you, you got rid of toxins, you did everything you could to boost your testosterone naturally. And you went from 700 to 900. Do you believe that there will be a behavioral change in this person? Do you believe that there will be higher success rate in this person? And, uh, and then I'll tell you my answer because I used to believe the wrong thing for basically the last 10 years. And just this year, I have learned the truth. That's funny because a lot of people like to focus on their ego and to get the higher number usually comes along with a benefit of, I have a high number, so I should be performing better. I think a lot of it's placebo. I think there's a lot of men who have higher numbers who don't know it. And because they don't get it tested and they have no idea, they don't act like they have higher numbers. But when it comes to a man who has 700 versus a man who has 900, I feel like there are very little things that the 200 nanograms per deciliter difference actually makes. I think the differences come a lot more steady when you're down at 200, 300, 400. Those are when the differences matter. But when you're already at the higher end of the reference range, that's where I think it becomes more of a placebo effect of having higher testosterone being able to make you feel more like a man, being able to show it off or feel like you need to act more manly because your testosterone is higher. Okay. That's what I've learned in my journey from between 10, um, 1031 nanograms per deciliter to 1293 nanograms per deciliter. My body has stayed pretty much the same. The way I look stays pretty similar, but my behavior changes because of me. So I've noticed that I've got my testosterone tested about six times in the past uh, five years. And each of these times I've been in different places in my life and I've noticed that my behavior sometimes where I feel the most masculine and the most manly, I actually don't have the highest testosterone at that time. Or I'm having the most sex or I'm doing the most high testosterone behavior, going to the gym the most. I actually have uh, around 1100, whereas when I had 1293, I was kind of depressed. I was not really going to the gym. I wasn't really doing much uh, exciting in my life. I was... Um, very stagnant, but my testosterone was high. So when I saw that, I said, well, I must be doing something right, or maybe I need to change what I'm doing because that testosterone level is working and it means that something's right. So I have to continue to do that behavior. But the problem was I had no idea what the behavior was because it was not a good place in my life. I got it. I got it. And, and before I tell you what I what myth was shattered in my life, which was super shocking to me. I want to take a step back and let's talk about what testosterone really is. Because I, very recently, uh, one of the athletes, uh, one of the Afro D athletes who, um, you know, has taken Afro D, I don't know, f three and a half months or so. He's a track and field Olympic level athlete. And he got his blood test done. And he, his doctor, 
ha allowed him to do his blood test in the afternoon. Okay, so so before we get into the blood test and all the, the basics of blood test and why it's so important to get it done, because you did touch on it and when someone should get it done, I want to talk about what testosterone actually is. So give us a overview of what is testosterone and more importantly, what does what is low testosterone? If someone is suffering from low testosterone, obviously they should go get their blood test done. And we're going to show you exactly how to do that and then give you some guidance. But if they, if they want to know qualitatively what their testosterone levels are, what feeling or what behavior correlates with low testosterone and what behavior correlates with high testosterone? Give me sort of the definition of testosterone from, from your own life experience and, and, and from your own expertise. Well, testosterone starts out as being stimulated in the testes, and it's an androgen that is in charge of a lot of different mechanisms happening within your body, within your brain. However, experiencing testosterone is a lot different than just growing testosterone because it fluctuates throughout the day. It starts higher in the morning, and then towards the end of the day, it actually dwindles down because of just the higher cortisol releases throughout the day and the different habits that you have throughout your daily process and your circadian clock. But so cortisol can take down testosterone, you're saying? Correct. Okay. All right. So then maybe those times when you had 1300 testosterone nanograms per deciliter total testosterone and you were depressed, could it be that your cortisol was high? My cortisol was pretty high. Okay. Because also I would do it in the mornings as well, which is when your cortisol is at the highest. Okay, got it, got it. So when we, so, and that's one of the reasons we wake up, right? This is this is this concept of uh, don't have coffee until ni ninety minutes after you wake up. You know, our boy Huberman taught us this, and then the papers show that. So um, you're saying that when you wake up in the morning, cortisol is the highest. Is that so? What so 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 now since we touched on cortisol, let's get to this, and then we can go back to testosterone. What is cortisol? Why does it matter to men? And what can high cortisol do to someone's life if it's chronically high, especially if it just remains high their whole life? Cyclical cortisol and chronically high cortisol are two very different things. There's a very important role for cortisol. There's the reason why it's being excreted and the body is expressing cortisol production because, like you said, it helps you wake up in the morning. It helps you get things done. It provides you the ability to protect yourself and others around you if needed. But constant cortisol from being in a stressful environment is going to provide your body with constant production. So it's not going to be able to have relief and be able to relax from that increase of cortisol. And then it's also going to increase things like blood pressure and other things that can overlap into other health aspects of your life. But like any good hormone, you want to have it as a cycle and you don't want to have a constant attack of this hormone, just like cortisol or dopamine or serotonin, because your body gets used to all of this overbearingness of this hormone in your body, which will basically just end up keeping you in a state of either ex ex high fear or high energy, high excitement, or the opposite, super low fear doled out, super low energy, low excitement. And when you don't have a good balance of these hormones, your body tends to suffer in ways that are not only physical, but a lot of it is also mental. Yeah, you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, how different behaviors correlate with cortisol, and we know from studies that mothers, and and these these have been definitely done in rats as well as other species, mothers who have, for some reason, they got stressed out because in in a lab. Uh, it is very easy for a scientist to, to stress out a, a mouse, right, or a rat. It's, it's very easy. They can do a lot of things. And, and like, for, for example, here, here's an example. So rats love darkness. And so if you put a rat in a cage and you shine light on him, he will literally run around the cage trying to avoid the light because rats love darkness, right? You know, in a New York City subway, you get those rats in the dark and they're walking around trying to find a hole, right? Cockroaches are like that too. They, they love darkness. So in a lab, if you want to scare and evoke cortisol, and in this case, glucocorticoids in this rat, 
then you're just going to shine light and literally the rat will run around trying to avoid it. If you do that to a, a mom rat, the glucocorticoid levels, the stress levels, or in this case, cortisol, you know, the, the equivalent of glu glucocorticoid in humans is cortisol. So the, the baseline glucocorticoid levels in this child, when he grows up, will be higher than average. And that is because the mother had some massive stress while she was pregnant with this child. And it's, it's, ma it's I mean, cortisol is crazy, right? So cortisol al also allows us to wake up in the morning. Without cortisol, we wouldn't be able to wake up. And we also know that a lot of men, when they, and, and we can talk about some, some TRT stuff later on. I'll, I'll write it down in my notes so we, we don't forget. But a lot of, um, a lot of men, you know, athletes included and, and movie stars, when they take steroids, their testosterone goes up, but because it's an exogenous testosterone injection, it is not natural, then their cortisol will also go up. Their estrogen will also go up. Their SHBG will also go up. Because these things have to bind to testosterone, right? Testosterone has to travel around the, the, the body, right? It travels in the blood through carrier proteins like SHBG, like albumin, like cortisol. It has to travel around. And uh, one thing I want to, uh, you know, you had, you gave a very nice definition of testosterone. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sex steroid hormone, right? That's the, the proper terminology. And what's interesting about the testosterone molecule is that it can have a genetic expression inside the nucleus of a cell. A lot of other, and, and, and the other cool thing about testosterone is that there's no gene for testosterone, right? It's not like a Oh, let me let me change the testosterone gene in a person. You cannot do that. Um, you can change enzymes and things like that, but not the gene. But what I, what I was going to say is, testosterone is so powerful that it can go inside the cell, and it can give it can it can allow for genetic expression inside the nucleus of a cell. So increasing that's why when you boost testosterone, right? Especially if you take steroids and you boost testosterone 10x. Or, or higher, you will feel higher libido. You will feel, uh, uh, you know, greater muscle mass. You will feel more energy. You will feel way more alive than you were before. But obviously, it's going to have, you know, a hundred other, you know, negative side effects. But this is why testosterone is so powerful. But what's interesting about testosterone is that it is only this powerful if you increase by 10x. If you increase your testosterone by two to 300 points or 100 points, and you're not low T, then you may not feel those differences in testosterone. Yes, it will help you. Obviously, it will help you. And we know this because of a lot of guys who we know who have done their before and after blood test results, they see their blood test results, be it a placebo, be it a real change, be it whatever. Even though the brain cannot detect small changes in testosterone, right? It's not like, oh, uh, look, uh, you know, imagine, imagine you had zero testosterone. And they've actually done these studies, right? Imagine you get castrated. And they've done this with rats. And then, you know, uh, unfortunately, back in the day, the young boys who were in choir, like in the church, they castrated them because the high, you know, that the high pitch voice was very, very sexy, right? For the, the church choir and, and for these, you know, so they can have a, a nice career, but doing the castration and allowing testosterone to not increase in these pu you know, pre pubertal males, they would remain having that high pitch voice. They wouldn't get the deep voice, you know, the deep testosterone voice. They wouldn't get that. So these so so imagine you took a rat and you you know obviously the, the the rat has testosterone as well imagine you took all of his testosterone away all of it do you think that all the all the behaviors we associate with testosterone right aggression um assertiveness uh muscle mass uh uh, uh erections uh, libido right do you think with zero testosterone, this rat would have zero aggression. No, just like with dogs who get neutered. Correct, correct. And and what's uh, what's interesting is that 
the there, there, e even though there is no testosterone present in this rat or in, in other animals which have been castrated and, you know, their balls been cut off or testosterone gets taken away, their aggression remains if they were aggressed, especially if they were aggressive before the testosterone got taken away. This is, this is very, very crucial. Any of these hormones, especially testosterone, it is not going to make you this X behavior or this Y behavior. It just makes you more of what you already are. So for example, a Buddhist, right? A Buddhist, very peaceful guy, the Dalai Lama type person. If you inject a testosterone in this person, they're not going to become aggressive. They're going to become more of what they already were. They were they're going to become more peaceful. They're going to become more kind. They're going to become more generous. And this is sort of the, the misunderstanding of testosterone that everyone has, right? Like someone who is very nice and someone who is very uh, um, sort of generous and kind and into their feminine side, you know, they might be like, oh, if I increase my testosterone, oh, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to become more aggressive. I don't want to become, uh, uh, you know, fighting people at the bar. That's not the case. Testosterone is only going to make you more of what you already are. And small changes in testosterone are not going to be detected by the brain. Now, what I want to ask you is uh, the relationship between testosterone and dopamine. Right, in your life and it, from your expertise, what have you seen? You know, when you when you ch told me that you you know you have gotten your blood test done six times, and obviously there's no dopamine test. We don't have that yet. There's no uh, you know like any like correlation with dopamine. Not really, except testosterone. But just from your perspective and from your expertise, first tell us what dopamine is, and what the hell is it, and why is it important for us. Right. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps with reward process. It allows you to feel good about something when you complete it, when you do an action, when you put effort into something, you enjoy something. It's a way for your body to tell itself that it's doing something that, that it feels good with, that it's enjoyable for the body. And it usually has a connotation that it comes with a lot of comfort. But I think that connotation is a little bit off because a lot of things that are natural for dopamine, like putting in hard work and being able to have a hard day and then feel good after that hard work is actually the opposite of comfort. It's the ability to put in effort and then to be able to enjoy your efforts after you complete them. So unfortunately, we can't test things like dopamine. We can't test things like serotonin, to my knowledge, yet, but... There are ways to understand how it works and there are ways to short circuit that processing, which is unfortunate because when you short circuit that processing, your body becomes less sensitive to things that are able to promote dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin. And your body is able to either get those exogenously or get those from activities that are short circuiting your typical pathways in order to optimize where your health is. So my question in that situation would be, how do we understand dopamine better, but also how do we understand why we have dopamine and why it's there for us versus using it as this button, right? You think of mice in a lab, you think they have this button that they can just click over and over and over again and get a treat or get juice or get something to get that dopamine hit. And then what happens to them over time is that they, they start to become accustomed to what happened in the, which what happened in the first place, which was, um, being able to get that snack, which at first was novel and now it's no longer novel. So my question with dopamine would be, how can we make it something that is consistent so that every time we do get dopamine, it feels just as good as it did the first time we got that dopamine hit versus allowing it to become subtle and to become more of a dependency. So how do you think we can do that? Well, throughout my own journey, I found that it doesn't feel good to take a dopamine reset as the trendy terms have been calling it, where you reset dopamine, where all of those things that excite you, even if they don't excite you anymore, but you look to them as a reason to be excited. For example, scrolling through social media, checking your phone in the mornings, checking your notifications to see if anyone messaged you. And those experiences 
are all almost second nature to people now. They wake up, they check their email, they wake up, they look at who texted them overnight, if anyone messaged them on Instagram, whatever that is. I think that the best way to appreciate that is to just spend a day not checking those things and realizing how much your body is craving you to check those things. That's what I've learned in my own personal experience. Um, things like YouTube, things that are um, easy to consume, things like Netflix shows, television series, things that are very easy to open up and click on and you can just sit back and relax. Being able to go through a day and not fall into those instincts gives you a better idea of how many things you're actually really excited about that take no effort on your end. So for example, if you want to have a delicious meal, you can either go out and order it and you'll have dopamine. It'll taste amazing. You'll enjoy it because you remember it being tasty. But if you cook it yourself or you go and you cook your own meal, it may not taste as good, but it's more effort and it's more rewarding for you to cook that meal for yourself. So what I personally do is I try and notice things that are very dopamine centric. For example, mindlessly scrolling or looking for videos that I want to watch or being able to always have a podcast running in the background or something to stimulate my brain and just noticing those feelings for a day and not reacting to them and seeing how strong those feelings get and how much they progress in my brain and how much I crave that. It is a very eye-opening experience for me to realize how much of a hold that these activities and this addiction to dopamine has on me. So Jameson, you mentioned that um, there is a proper protocol to optimize dopamine. This is what I'm hearing from you. And it's not like mindlessly scrolling on Instagram because that obviously will, uh, uh, you know, it'll make you crave more dopamine and you'll, you know, you'll be addicted. And a lot of people are addicted to these social medias and, and infinite scrolling. Um, and, and by the way, just so you know, Jameson, that the person who invented the infinite scroll, his name is Azra Stone, I believe. Um, he is the business partner of Tristan Harris, who's the guy who made the documentary A Social Dilemma. And Azra and Tristan are, are now fighting the social media companies because they are weaponizing attention and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And what's interesting is that Azra's dad is the one who invented the mouse, like the mouse itself. And so they come from a very uh, uh, technologically superior, you know, technologically minded family. And now they are fighting uh, all the tech giants on, on this topic, which is phenomenal. So now the, the topic of dopamine, right? We're now, uh, um, actually, before we get deep into dopamine, because there's a lot of uh, depth there, Let's go back to blood tests because we want to know if a per so for example the the Afro D athlete who got his blood test done, uh, you know he got it done in the afternoon and and to me uh, an afternoon blood test means nothing like it's just garbage number, but this is me I'm I'm very opinionated in this and it, it's to me ridiculous and criminal that blood test centers allow for afternoon testosterone tests it's just incredibly dumb. So my question to you is, what is the protocol or what is the method that you've always used that a normal person should use, especially in the in a, a, a Western country that might you know have blood tests? And we may not know about the Eastern third world countries. We may not know about those. But for someone in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in New Zealand, in Australia, in South Africa, these countries, what is the proper method to get a blood test done? And why should someone even get a blood test done in the first place? The why is very important. The why first is to get a snapshot at what's going on in your body, if there's anything that is causing any long-term issues. Blood test isn't going to give you a perfect answer, but if something has been bothering you enough to make an impact on one of your biomarkers, then it should be something that is looked at. Now, this is important to note as well that Sometimes the reference ranges aren't ideal for your body. So if you look the reference ranges and you're, per, you're in all of them, that still might not mean that everything's okay. And if you're not in all of them, that still might mean that you're By okay. in all of them, you mean within the reference within range. Within the reference range, exactly. 
there are some times where you have to look and compare to other markers and see if being high in one thing and being low in another is actually um, normal for you or that means that you need to work on something. Like for example, vitamin D, the reference range was I believe 12 for a long time. And now it's, I've seen people have it as low, I was high as 50 for the bottom minimum reference range. And a lot of that can get into the vitamin D industry and being able to supplement and all the benefits that come with vitamin D as well and being able to be aware of those. But there's a lot of things going on that aren't spoken of, like 25D versus 125D and magnesium serum versus red blood cell magnesium. There's different tests that are very similar, but they can give you a very different result. And we don't really know this very well. So when I take blood tests, I always take with a grain of salt because I don't know exactly what's happening behind the scenes there. Each lab is different and it's good to be able to look at it over time and compare it to your past instead of trying to fit into a range that may or may not be ideal for your health. That's just an average of the other people who are tested by that lab. However, my protocol is very simple. I make sure to fast before I go. And a lot of the tests you get like cholesterol are going to require you to fast. And what that means is basically anywhere from eight to 12 hours without food. So that's why it's best to do it in the morning because you can go to bed and then wake up the next day and then go to your facility to get your blood drawn. Now here's a conundrum. Sometimes they have you not urinate until you get to the blood test center. So this is one that I've always had to deal with because I always like to do urine tests. You can do a lot of testing through urine as well. It usually goes hand in hand. And I think urine testing provides much more of a snapshot of what you're doing right now, whereas versus blood test is providing more of a snapshot of, you know, the past 12 months or the past six months and how you've treated your body over time. Doing something isn't going to change your body can, like, right away. If you do something for a week and get a blood test before and after, it's not going to make huge change in your cholesterol, let's say, or your testosterone. But the ratios of, say, for example, similar hormone panels, I'm looking at my SHBG, my testosterone, my free testosterone. Those are all important to get together because when you get them together, that's what's happening in that moment. And also that's what's happening at that time of day. Because when you do get something in the afternoon, it might have a different result and your body may just be in a different cycle. Most men have a 24 hour cycle. Most women have a 28 ish day cycle. So depending on what time of the month or what time of the day you go get your blood drawn, you are going to have different results. So you don't need to freak out if your results aren't the same across the board, but it is important to look at your blood tests consistently and take them over time. I think taking them once a year is a good minimum. If you can take it twice a year, that'd be even better. And I would also recommend being able to fast and preparing yourself for a fast, at least eight hours. And then also making sure that if you do need to urinate in a cup, that you are not going to be in too much pain and you are able to prepare for that. And if they want you to urinate, then you can, you know, do that and not be stressed out. That's my biggest issue because sometimes they make me pee in a cup and I have to go there first thing in the morning and they don't want me to pee all day. So I have to wake up and not pee and then go and get and, and wait. And that's stressing me out because, you know, your body really has to go to the bathroom, but you can't go until you're at the office and then they need to give you the cup and you go to the bathroom to pee in the cup. Anyways, I found a workaround with that, which is literally just asking for a cup um, the day before, or if it's something that's close to you, you can just go pick it up. And then on the day of your test, you can just pee in the morning and then bring it to them. But that's the least of your worries. That's just semantics. That's something that accentuates the importance of stress. If you have a very high stress morning, your blood test is going to be a lot different than it is if you had a low stress morning because certain things like cortisol and other hormones in your body can have a large impact on that snapshot because your results can change throughout the day. That's why it's good to get a good look or consistency over multiple years of your blood tests because over time you'll start to see patterns and maybe you'll say, well, that day I was actually really stressed and that time I got my blood test, I actually woke up really late and just was off my usual schedule and my cycle was messed up. And you can start to see averages of where your body is usually around versus outliers, which may not be an accurate representation of how your health is doing overall. 
Gotcha. And then also explain your protocol of what blood tests you get done. I know from your results that I've seen in the past, you get thousands of tests done, and which is great because I do the same thing. But someone who is starting off, maybe this person has never done a blood test in their life. What is the minimum uh, requirements that you recommend someone do to get their test done? The best panel is going to be something that covers your comprehensive metabolic panel and your basic metabolic panel, as well as your hormones and your fat soluble vitamins and those kind of important steps. Like I would say number one would be the metabolic comprehensive panel. That one is just really good to look at everything that's going on right now in your body. Talks about like your salt level, make sure you get things like hemoglobin A1C so you can tell what your fasting insulin is. And of course your cholesterol, because a lot of your hormone um, hormones use cholesterol to be shuttled around and to be transported. So you have to make sure you have good cholesterol levels. And if you don't test that with your hormone levels, that could be a huge red flag that you're not looking into. I would say the big three are your vitamin D, your metabolic um, panel, comprehensive metabolic panel, and your cholesterol. Now, if we want to go into more details, I would say a hormone panel, which doesn't have to be a full hormone panel. And by full, I mean you get your dihydrotestosterone test, you get your luteinizing hormone tested, you're getting your DHEA tested, your estradiol. All those things are great, but for a first go around, I think the best thing to do if you only had a few choices would be your free testosterone, your total testosterone, and your sex hormone binding globulin, as well as your albumin, which is usually included in your basic metabolic panel anyways. And then if you want to get into more details with other vitamins, I'd say the big ones to look at would be magnesium, and would be zinc. Your zinc plasma and your magnesium, your red blood cell magnesium would be what you want to look at. They usually just do serum magnesium, but this isn't as accurate as your red blood cell magnesium. So if I were going to the doctor for the first time, that's what I would look into. And sometimes you have really good doctors and they'll see things and they'll start adding things in there as well that they want to look at and different panels that they want to look into depending on what issues you're dealing with. But Going into a blood panel without having any issues is usually not going to give you a lot of testing. They're not going to have any, if you have no problems, then great. We'll do a basic test, make sure everything looks good. Unless you have issues or something that's bothering you, you usually don't get anything that's, that's more deep than just your basic metabolic panel. So when I go to the doctor's office now, I just ask for things I want. So for example, I did an iron panel the other, the other, um, blood test I had a few months ago, and I looked at my ferritin, my iron binding capacity. I looked at my iron levels. Now, do I have any issues? Do I have any things that might be ailments for my iron? Not that I know of, but I want to take a closer look at it because I know that a lot of my spent, um, my time spent in my youth, I was consuming iron fortified foods. I was consuming a lot of iron from the tap water, and it was something that I was concerned of. Was my childhood still affecting me to this day? Do I still have excess iron that I need to work with? Or do I have not enough iron? Or do I have unhealthy iron that is that is just not treating my body well? I had to figure out, do my own research and <laughs> learn to figure out what I wanted to do. Now, if you were to just show up to your doctor's office and be like, I want this, 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 they're probably not going to give it to you unless you have a really good reason as to why. So unfortunately, the best thing to do to start is to get a basic panel and to see if there's anything on there that looks off. If there's something on there that looks off, then your doctor will probably allow you to get more blood tests. And that's where you start diving into that deeper layer of what's actually going on and looking at other tests. And of course, if you're sexually active, I would highly recommend an STI panel. That's super important as well. That would be a great one to add to the addition of your normal um, metabolic panel, vitamin D, and the panel for cholesterol. I think STI test is right up there with those top three. And you should probably be doing that every time you get a blood test, especially if you're having new sexual partners. And even if you're not having new sexual partners, but you have a, a wife or a husband or somebody in your life that you're consistently um, being with, it's good to keep tabs on that just to make sure that everything's okay and there's nothing that's happening from that person. But that is just for preventative measures, obviously. Just like most blood tests are per for preventative measures for you to make sure that you're in good health. So the big three or the big four now we just added would be comprehensive metabolic panel, 
vitamin D. If you can get 125D and 25D, most doctors will just do 25D, but that's a little bit different. That's a whole different conversation. 25D is more of your ability of, of, of being able to have storage of vitamin D. 125D is the vitamin D you're actually using. So that's one, that one's kind of fun if you have some issues with vitamin D to look into. And then there's also the cholesterol panel, and this is the LDL, the, um, the, H, the HDL, being able to look into your cholesterol level and making sure you look at your triglycerides as well. Most panels for cholesterol will include triglycerides, but that is what you really want to focus on. And LDL and HDL fluctuates based on a lot of genetic determinants and your diet. So having a high LDL isn't the end of the world. Having a low HDL is actually probably a little bit more something you should work on than having a high LDL because maybe your body is just naturally having a high LDL, but your triglycerides are low or your body has a high HDL and a high LDL. So being able to look at that from a perspective of, okay, maybe I'm not in the perfect reference range or I'm not in the middle of the range, but maybe this is normal for my body. And then once you get those tests done, or if you want to add another test, add the hormone panel, of course, the STI test. But the hormone panel would just be your testosterone, your free testosterone, your, and your SHBG. And after you look at those, then you can have an idea of what you want to do next. If you want to do something, if there's something you need to dive further into, or this is the fun part, you get to experiment with your life. You get to spend the next six months to a year changing your lifestyle, changing your habits, changing your diet, your exercise, changing the way that you act throughout the day and the way you treat others. And then you can get tested again and see if there's anything different. Now, I personally have done a lot of blood tests as Farhan mentioned. I have seen many things change and I've seen many things stay the exact same. So there's been a ways where I've changed my, my diet and my cholesterol totally changed. And then there's been times I've changed my diet and supplemented and the exact thing that I was trying to fix has stayed the exact same, even through expensive supplements and lifestyle changes. Now, there are ways that that's happening, but that's basically telling you that maybe there's something else going on. Maybe it's not as clear as you think it will be. So that's the fun part about blood tests. They provide clues for what you can add to your lifestyle and what you can do in order to be in your peak physical and mental state. Got it. One thing, uh, Jameson, I want you to answer is, what does a low testosterone person feel? Because um, you've had several clients and, and, and people you work with for you know, the last many, many years, and a lot of guys are in Afro-D-Nation that you see in, in, our, in our group, in our community, and you see they have low T. And a lot of the same stories emerge because someone who's watching us right now and he is saying, well, you know, I, I'm uh, 50 years old. I've never done a blood test before. I don't really give a shit. Uh, you know, just tell me how to increase my testosterone or tell me how to get this better or that better and I'm good. You know, give me a magic pill, uh, give me an injection, whatever. But before we get into that, what, what sorts of symptoms and signs of low testosterone are there. And maybe there's some misinformation out there. Maybe there's something, uh, some, some people might say, oh, a, a, a low testosterone person is this. But actually, a high testosterone person could also be that. Or they say, oh, if you have low testosterone, you're never going to get this. But actually, a high testosterone person also never gets this. So are there very specific and very clear guidelines that if you are suffering from these three or these five or these 20 things, you have low T. There are a few red flags that you can look for in your overall health. However, there are a lot of things that people assume that comes with high T where it actually doesn't affect you. For example, mental health. There is a lot of talk about having high testosterone makes men more aggressive and angry and resentful and argumentative. But at the same time, there's actually a lot of men who are low testosterone, who are very unsettling and upset and get into a lot of fights and are very angry people. So that is a big common myth that people with high testosterone are toxic masculine. And having high testosterone is being um, 
a very overbearing male and someone that is dangerous to society. Now, there's a difference between being dangerous to society and having the capacity to have danger in society, as Jordan Peterson talks about. But when you are talking about testosterone, there are a few things in the body that are improved when you have higher testosterone. For example, the ability to put on muscle, the ability to get morning wood, things that you can notice physically in your body, the way that your hair is grown. You have different ways that your hair is grown, that your hair is grown on your back, if it's grown on your face, if it's grown on your head. Those have a lot to do with your receptors in your body and the DHT that acts with those receptors. Now, people think high DHT means you're going to be bald, but that's not the case. It actually has a lot to do with your DHT receptors, which is way different than the actual amount of DHT you have in your body, as long as it's harmonious with your body and your hormone levels. And there's also things like morning wood, which men know that when they have low testosterone, it's usually a telltale sign of not having morning wood. But this also comes from other issues, right? Men who can't get erect during sex may have high testosterone, but they may also have other issues that are causing that lack of erection. And this could be diet related. This could be lifestyle related. This could be mentally related, but there are more things than just not having erection that could be a sign of either low testosterone or high testosterone. And if you have high testosterone and you don't have an erection, then it's probably a good sign that it's something outside of your hormone levels. Your hormone levels aren't the problem right now. You have to look at something else, whether it be the amount of food you're consuming, the amount of um, mental stimulation you're receiving sexually, or how you're feeling about yourself emotionally. There are all different factors that could cause an erection. Morning wood is a much, much simpler pathway that is a lot more biologically related versus mentally related. So if morning wood isn't there, that is a good sign that maybe you should get your levels checked. And if your levels are good and you don't have morning wood, then it's a good sign that maybe your body needs more naturally just for your body to be in homeostasis, or you need to change something around in your diet or something in the kind of nutrition that you're consuming. Maybe you're biomarkers are off in some nutrition level and your vitamins are low. But when it comes to looking at things outside of testosterone, I would say that making sure that your dopamine levels are good is going to be a lot of inner reflection. And that is where a lot of the questioning of yourself comes in and the questioning of men who have low testosterone. They're always wondering, why am I feeling like this? Why do I not feel motivated? Why do I not feel happy in life? Why do I not feel excited about living and excited about my partner? And I'm here to tell you that as someone who has high testosterone naturally, a lot of those feelings already still come up. So that isn't going to be solved by you getting higher testosterone. That isn't going to be something that is going to be instantly fixed. A lot of men are looking for that as an answer. Oh man, I'm, I'm, once I get high testosterone, I'll be happy. Once my T levels are above the range or in the high range, I'm going to be happy. There is a little bit of boost of mood and a boost of um, a motivation that comes with testosterone, especially if you're low and you double or triple your testosterone, you will definitely notice a difference, but you still have to react to that in, within your body. And that's where the benefits will really come from. However, men who have low T need to be appreciated. And right now, men who have low T are almost normalized and it seems like it's not a big deal. It seems like it's just part of their lifestyle. Maybe they're very sedentary. Maybe they think it's fine because they don't want to be high T. You know, they're happy with their dad bod. They're happy they're looking the way they do. But from a health perspective, having optimal testosterone for your body doesn't have to be super high. It doesn't have to be 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. It doesn't have to be 900 nanograms per deciliter. If your testosterone is in a healthy range, it has a lot more effects than just being able to put on muscle and be ma macho and be all strong and, and fit and hairy. It has a lot of effects on your mental health as well and your ability to have comfort in a situation and your ability to express your emotions properly. So that's very important. And it's not just about being manly. I think optimizing your testosterone levels is a lot deeper than just being manly. So that's a big myth that I want to shatter right there is the association with association with testosterone and manliness and how it has to be together and how it's either a really good thing or a really bad thing. 
And some men are even afraid of being too manly now because they're afraid of being shamed in society for being too manly. So they like being able to go below the radar and just lay back and not be the focus and just kind of relax and not have to worry about having high libido or being too motivated or too driven. They just do their normal thing. And I'm here to tell you that having optimal testosterone is a lot more important to your health than just being a manly person. It has a lot to do with what your body is doing internally and how your blood is optimizing the rest of your body and your brain. But also it has a lot to do with being able to just have that overall health and not getting illnesses and not getting um, issues with your body, health issues, ending up in hospitals that I think is natural human instinct. You want to avoid those things at all costs. So that's where the importance of testosterone really comes down to is being able to have a optimal health snapshot and being able to avoid getting into dangerous situations. If, for example, getting sick, getting injured and ending up in a hospital. Gotcha. Jameson, you mentioned nutrition and nutrition is a very uh, involved topic. So maybe we'll touch on it, but I mean, everyone is different, but maybe we'll touch on it. But before we touch on nutrition and even exercise, we can touch on. I want to talk about sleep. It's not something you mentioned yet. And um, I want to really ask, I, I want to really underscore the how important sleep is for testosterone production. So let's discuss this a little bit. So for me right now, uh, today I woke up at 3.30, okay? Yesterday I woke up at 3. The day before that I woke up at 4. The day before that I woke up at 3.30. So my my sleep never used to be like this, ever, ever, ever. And for me right now, sleeping at 8 and waking up at 4 seem to be optimal. And the way, how do I see what is optimal, right? For me, optimal is having the ability to be in the moment. Whenever a thought or a stress response occurs in my body, to have the ability to be aware of it and understand where it's coming from, if I can understand where it's coming from, rather than giving into it. Now, the basics of how I want to feel during the days, you know, when I do my workout, I want to feel strong. I want to feel mobile. I want to have that flexibility. When I do my breath work, I want to be without thoughts. I want to do it in the moment and, and completely immersed in that world. When I do my cold plunges, my ice baths every morning, I want to be able to do them in a very serene and calm way. This is for me how the morning would start. During the day when I'm doing my work, when I'm reading my books, when I'm making videos with you or with other guests, and if I'm making solo podcasts, I want to be in the zone during these podcasts but also be aware of what is happening and, and be aware of what is happening with my body and being aware of what is happening with my mind. And then at the end of the day, not have high basal levels of cortisol, have very chill levels of cortisol and be able to relax and listen to music and dance and, and make love and, and have a very mellow, very, very chill night and then again, go to sleep at 8 p.m. after reading some Gulag Archipelago. Um, so this is my current sleep protocol. I've changed so much in my life. Back in Vegas, I was sleeping at 6 a.m., waking up at 12 p.m. every day. You know, for a year, I messed this up. And then during undergrad and grad, and, and grad school was better because we had to wake up in the morning to, to do the monkey experiments. But in, in undergrad, I was, again, you know, sleeping at 4 or 5 a.m. doing programming assignments and then waking up at 1, 1 p.m. So my question is, in your experience with, with, your, uh, with your community and, 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 and customers and clients and, and friends and colleagues and, and the, the whole everything that you know, what role does sleep play in hormone optimization, especially testosterone optimization, 
And what have you learned about your own habits? And what can you teach us that will help someone optimize their health through sleep? First and foremost, sleep is the basis. Sleep is the base of the pyramid. If you look at the hierarchy of exercise, diet, nutrition, and sleep, I would put sleep as the base of that hierarchy because you can't out eat, out exercise a bad sleep routine. Now, there's a lot of information out there of people who are saying that, oh, as long as I get my eight hours or my seven hours or my nine hours of sleep, it doesn't matter what time I go to sleep. It doesn't matter where I'm at. It doesn't matter how everything's working. Now, this is tough for people who work night shifts, right? There's a lot of people who work at night and they sleep during the day because that's what their lifestyle is. And I don't think that's the end of the world. I don't think that's going to be super detrimental to them. I've lived in that for a little bit where I was working one summer and did have to work at night sometimes. But my sleep schedule has worked best when I am able to sleep when I'm tired, right? And some people don't get tired until 9, 10, 11, 12. This is where you have to really look into your environment and be able to control that environment. Just like Huberman says, there is a lot of effect that we have on our sleep. It's not just about, okay, I'm going to sleep at this time because this is when I want to sleep. There's a reason why your body might be acting the way it does. And if you have issues falling asleep, there might be a reason like that. Just like there might be reasons why you're waking up at a certain time. If you're waking up early, there might be reasons why your body is waking up early. With me, I noticed that if I don't stay up late and have screens and have phones and I'm using those, it's very easy for me to go to sleep. But if I'm looking at screens and I'm looking at my phone, after 8 or 9 p.m., I find it very difficult to fall asleep. And I find sleeping to be something that is more of an effort than natural, right? I want to focus on being able to be sleeping natural. I like when I can be tired. I like when I can go to my bed and want to go to sleep versus staying up because I don't feel sleepy enough yet and waiting and waiting and waiting for my body to tell me that it's time to go to bed. So in college, I've been on both sides of the spectrum as well. Sometimes I stay up late. Sometimes I go to bed early. Sometimes I didn't get enough sleep, but I also noticed how much of a detriment that not getting sleep would do. And I also noticed that if I don't sleep well, I still get eight to nine hours of sleep, but I don't feel good throughout the day. I feel tired. I feel groggy. I feel like I need to take a nap. Even when I wake up, I feel like I can't get out of bed. So those are all good signs of something that might be off, right? For example, if you go to bed at say 1 a.m. and wake up at 9 p.m., but you wake up and you can't get out of bed and you're struggling to get out of bed, that's a good sign that maybe your sleep schedule is the problem and not the eight hours. So you need to figure out how to improve your sleep schedule. And on top of your sleep schedule, maybe improve how you sleep. So I'm going to give a couple tips for how to improve your sleep schedule and how you sleep. The tips to improve your sleep schedule are very popularized now. Thank thankfully, we have people like Dr. Huberman who can share this information about viewing the sunlight in the morning and viewing the sunlight and the sunset before you sleep. Now, that's probably the best thing you can do. There's a lot of talk about wearing blue light blocking glasses and, and being able to find these little hacks that allow your body to um, get sleepier at night. And those definitely work. And I've done those. And there's different methods that can be beneficial from that. But that just gets way too into mental masturbation. I think that you have to focus on the basics first. And the basics are get sunlight when you wake up, go outside, get fresh air, go ground, maybe exercise in the morning if you want to. And then that starts your day off, gives you energy. And then if you can watch the sunset, and then after the sunset, don't sit in a room with bright lights like these. Don't be shining yourself with all these bright lights and keeping yourself awake because a lot of blue lights and LED lights when you're supposed to be asleep are very powerful. So I'd say after 8 p.m., after the sun's all the way down, if you're watching these lights and you're trying to have a normal sleep schedule, say a you know a 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. or 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. or 11 to 7 sleep schedule and you're viewing these these lights that is going to be very damaging for you the best time to view these lights is during the day 
they have no harm during the day or anytime you're trying to be awake. Say you're trying to have a nocturnal um, clock and you work at a hospital and these lights are on at the hospital and you're working from, um, say, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. So you're going to want to view these lights while you're working to keep you awake, to keep you alert. And then after 5 p.m., if you want to go back home and go to bed, don't view these lights. Make sure you don't view the lights above you because they're going to get your body to wake up versus getting your body to fall asleep. So light viewing is crucial. Being able to get outside, get grounded, that helps with your circadian clock. And that will allow you to be more tired before you go to bed. So that's very important. Because as we know from our own personal experience and of a lot of our clients, sleep and testosterone are very correlated. And if you have a good sleep routine, not only do you recover better, not only do you have less food cravings, but your hormones are also more in alignment. So Sleep timing and sleep consistency, of course, are probably the most beneficial. And then when it comes to sleeping, best things that I've done are invest in a pillow that I put over my eyes to help me block out the light because that'll allow me to sleep throughout the night. And especially with living in an area where there's natural light outside from other than just the moon, just being able to have areas that have street lights and car lights, as well as mouth taping and being able to breathe in a harmonious way with my nose and not with my mouth and subconsciously being able to train my body to continue to breathe throughout my nose and not always through my mouth when I'm sleeping, which is a very normal process. But unfortunately, people are in a position where they're so used to mouth breathing that when they're asleep, their body just naturally goes into mouth breathing, which will allow them to wake up with less energy, unfortunately. And it isn't as effective as nasal breathing. So those are the two big ones. Viewing sunlight and being able to find a way to train your body to breathe through the nose. And a way to cover your eyes so that you're not getting a lot of different light. Now, there's probably a thousand other things people can go into. But I want to just cover the most potent and prominent things that you can make an adjustment in for your sleep in order to optimize your sleep and that I've made in my life in order to optimize my sleep. Because I actually found out that I was snoring. One of my friends, while I was having a sleepover, he was like, I didn't expect you to snore. I thought you were really healthy. And I was like, what the hell? Why would I snore? That's when I started figuring out that, okay, I need to make sure I hydrate before bed. I need to make sure I mouth tape. I need to make sure that I don't crank my neck all the way up with my pillow. I need to be in a harmonious position to sleep. Because I was always wondering why I would wake up and have such a tough time getting out of sleep, getting up. And I've noticed now that if I go to bed early and wake up early, getting out of bed is very easy. But if I go to bed late and wake up late, getting out of bed is very difficult. So that's another observation that I've had with myself that helps me understand what's best for my body for sleep time. Thank you for giving such a great uh, overview of sleep and, and, and hormone levels. One thing I want to add is the metabolic relationship to sleep. So I remember reading this really amazing paper. It was published in Science. I, I read it a couple of months ago. And what they did was they looked at leptin, ghrelin levels. And they also looked at how the craving for different types of food changes when people are sleep deprived. So they took a bunch of people, right? These are humans, not, not rats. And they've shown in rats too, but this is cool because it was in humans. And what they did was they had one group of people sleep for the normal eight hours and the other group of people were sleeping for five hours, right? So it was a huge difference. And they had for a part of the experiment because they wanted to control the food intake, right? Because you don't want one group to be taking, you know, some American diet and another one to be doing some other diet, and vegan diet and keto diet and all this. So they had for a certain duration of the experiment uh, done an IV to inject a very constant amount of glucose in this person. So they had a very, very tightly controlled experiment. It was very, very good. And what they were doing is they were measuring leptin ghrelin levels and seeing how you respond to different food types, you know, different macronutrients. Now, what is leptin and ghrelin, right? Ghrelin is the hormone that allows you to feel hungry. You can call it the hunger hormone, gray, graylin, uh, as, as some people call it. And leptin is the satiety hormone. This is what allows you to feel full. So 
what they found is that the people who were sleep deprived, they were hungrier. So they had higher ghrelin levels. They were not being satiated like the, like the control, like the others. They had low leptin levels. And when I mean low, I mean significantly lower than average. Then it gets cooler. What they had them do is look at different types of foods, right? So junk carbs, like processed carbs, fats, proteins, vegetables, fruits, and so on. And they simply asked, how much are you craving this food? And because this was a very well-controlled experiment, it was proper to ask this. It's not like there was some confound with something, so now you don't believe this person. You really believe them. And what they found is that protein had no effect. There, there was no craving effect with protein. They, they craved protein the same amount. However, on the other side of the spectrum were junk carbohydrates, high sugar processed carbohydrates. There was a significantly more craving for that type of food. Now you can understand and, and I don't know if you felt this, but I definitely have in my life when I was sleep deprived, I would be hungrier. And I wouldn't be hungry for like good food. I would be hungry for junk food. So imagine the downward spiral that society is going through, right? You are stressed in, in life. You lack sleep because you maybe have three jobs or you come home late, you get in a fight and it takes you two hours to go to sleep. Maybe you're taking melatonin and that's messing up your melatonin levels because you're getting like a thousand times the, the physiological range. There's all these issues. And then you wake up in the morning after five hours of sleep, four hours of sleep, and you have all this food around. You got McDonald's, got Coca-Cola, my favorite, you know, or Coca-Cola. Um, you have all of these very cheap available, readily available foods. So now, Jameson, when, if someone is having a family and they're, they're trying to run a business or they work and they are sleep deprived and they, they just have a hard time getting their life straight, where do they start? Because when they are sleep deprived, and their hunger and satiety hormones are out of whack, and now they are craving junk food, which is now feeding into the cycle of you know not being confident with their body, or having sexual dysfunction, or or uh, 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 you know not being able to wear the clothes they want, you know, and so on and so forth. Not getting the blood flow. You know, it's just so many negative side effects of having bad sleep which lead into metabolic syndrome, which lead into a downward spiral and, and, and negativity in life. So if someone is suffering from this, what tips can you give them in order to start sleeping better? Especially if they have such a hard time establishing a habit. What is something practical you can tell them? Uh, something to just start doing. The first thing that I would do in that scenario, if it were me, is try and figure out a way to walk outside after I wake up. I would just make a make an initiative to get to the door, you know, to wake up. Maybe I need to check when I need to check or do something. Avoiding things is a lot harder, I found, than just adding new things. So if you're trying to wake up and avoid checking the phone, avoid eating, you know, food right away, it takes a lot more willpower, but I found the willpower to just go and do something a little bit different is a lot easier. So if you were to say, go outside to go on your balcony, to get into a place where you can add something instead of trying to optimize it right away off the bat and change your diet and change your whole process. I think if you can add something that would be beneficial, it would be to walk. And hopefully doing these things would allow you to then have less urges 
to do things like check your phone right away, to do things like go and brew a coffee right away, or to do uh, do things like go off a sugary food right away. Let, let me ask you something, Jameson, because I can I can bet you money that someone is watching us right now and they're like, why? Why the hell would I go outside? <laughs> um, and, 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 and before we, I mean, I'll tell you my, my personal story. Before I found the, the lectures of, of, of Andrew Huberman, I didn't really understand the importance of going outside at all, right? And it's not like, let's say someone who's used to waking up in the morning you know, they turn on their lights, whatever. Uh, maybe they wake up, let's say, 8 a.m., all right? Now they're getting ready for work. So they, you know, they're, they're feeding uh, breakfast to their kids. They're maybe, you know, give up a kiss to their partner, you know, their wife, husband. And then they, they uh, uh, you know, maybe they, they prepare for work. Maybe they answer a few emails. You know, they're checking their Facebook or, or Instagram, um, and then, you know, they're hearing that the kids, maybe there's a baby crying in the other room. Uh, maybe the TV is playing as someone's watching TV. Maybe there's a grandfather at home, like whatever the case is. Now, how can you motivate this person, especially if they're science inclined, if they're like mechanistically inclined and they may, m might find something cool with why they should view sunlight at in the morning first thing? It'd be a lot easier if they're science inclined, right? Because if people just want to mentally masturbate or if they don't give a shit, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to get them to try something new. If they're science inclined, there's at least really cool science regarding the effects of a certain amount of lumens, a certain amount of brightness on your eyes within a certain window of waking up and how that effect starts a circadian clock and allows you to then create and pr produce hormones in your body to last for the rest of the day that then regulates the time that you feel tired at night. And when it gets sciencey, it's actually very cool on how powerful sunlight, which can using, you know, cholesterol can synthesize hormone, hormone D with your skin as you go outside. And this system already proves that sun has some kind of power on us because when we go outside in the sunlight and we get this hormone desynthesis in our skin, we don't get that from lights inside. There is something happening out in sunlight that we are not getting from the lights in here. And there is something different with sunlight. And it is very powerful at recharging. And for, <laughs> as the, the energy people would say, recharging what our bodies are, are needing in a non-food perspective. And there's a system there. And what, what this is, is part of that synthesis. And not only is it the skin synthesis, but it's also the brightness in the eye and how bright the sun is compared to everything else around you. And the amount of lumens in the sun is going to provide your body with that brightness versus you being inside all morning with very bright lights would probably not provide an effective amount of brightness versus going out in the sun for five minutes. Even on a cloudy day, you'll get more brightness from being outside than sitting inside with LEDs on or sitting inside looking at a, hol a halogen lamp or something like that to try and get your brightness from. That's why sunlight is so cool because from a scientific perspective, it has such a, it, it's a light where we can tell that sunlight is light and inside light is light, but it has such a different effect on our body and it has such a different effect on our eyes and the ability to take in that sunlight than we would get from these lights inside, which is why I find it to be so interesting and why all the research coming out now proving that there is an effect on your skin and your eyes with sunlight is so interesting to a lot of people because it's proof that a lot of things we've done in the past traditionally, naturally actually made sense. But right now, my biggest cool moment was just realizing that the lights outside have a huge difference on the lights indoors. And that made me curious about what else does it have a difference on? What else could be happening from outside light that I'm not getting from inside light? I don't get sunburned inside, but if I'm outside, I get sunburned because I'm outside for too long. But I also noticed that I only get sunburned if I go out for too long in the sun. I've never been sunburned for being outside for 10 minutes. I've only been sunburned when I'm outside 
for an hour on the beach, two hours on the beach, and I don't have any clothes on, I don't have any sunscreen on, I'm just in a bathing suit. That's when I notice I get the most sunburn, but it happens in the wintertime too. It happens when I'm reflecting sun off snow. It happens when there's sun coming from places that are cold, if I'm in a cold area. So the heat wasn't it either. It was the sun itself and the light from the sun, which got into the different rays, the UVA rays, the UVB rays, being able to understand what the different rays do and how that affects your skin, how that affects your eyes. And that was what really intrigued me about being able to optimize sunlight and use sunlight as a source of energy and not be afraid of sunlight as something that is going to hurt me or something that has no use for me other than getting me sunburned. Yeah, Jameson, you touched on so many cool points, man. Uh, one, I remember uh, seeing a paper about a month ago, very, very recent paper, and they looked at UVA and UVB lights and they actually showed that people who get sunlight have a significantly they they it's not it wasn't like higher testosterone but they said it like correlated with a uh, uh, higher testosterone like indirectly so that effect was there but definitely there was an effect on libido there was other sexual benefits to being outside and getting the sunlight and this was a it was a I think it was a science or a cell paper it was a really really awesome finding so we know scientifically that there is a sexual benefit to um, viewing sunlight. And I always used to wonder, like, you know, whenever I would live in beach cities or whenever I would talk to people who live near the beach, they would always be like nicer. They would be more hippie. They would be like very sexually expressive. They would be free in the world. You know, they, they would not give a fuck so much, right? They, they would be uh, into their own bodies and, and they would love their own bodies. And I always wondered, like, what is going on? Is it the river? I mean, is it like the sea? Is it the sand? What's going on? And, and with this paper, I realized that it's the sunlight. <laughs> People who live near the beach, obviously they have water and they can swim in the water and get the sand, right? They get the exfoliation when they, the feet touch the sand. They, they get that, uh, the, 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 the arches of their feet uh, to, to uh, get stimulated. Many, many benefits of, of being on sand but also they get more sunlight when they are at the beach, right? There's no buildings blocking them. But I also want to touch on this very interesting thing you mentioned about the circadian rhythm and, and about the clock, right? So inside our hypothalamus, there is something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this area literally has a clock. And it's not just the suprachiasmatic nucleus that has a clock. Every single cell inside your body has a clock. Every organ has its own clock. And the body can coordinate this clock throughout all these different cells. And this is super cool because if you, let, let's say you put, they've done these experiments where they take a bunch of people and scientists included, and they go in, go in a cave, right? Now in a cave, you are not exposed to sunlight have zero lumen, you know, zero lux, no light. But when they, when they experimented with how these people slept, they still slept according to the circadian rhythm with no sunlight, right? They would sleep around you know, 10 p.m., 9, 10 p.m., wake up around 6 a.m., more or less, you know, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. And this experiment went on for a month. And there's no changes, right? People would, I mean, maybe a little bit here and there change, but the, the sleeping was according to the clock that is already established in the brain. And obviously, this is from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, from different organs. And what happens is sometimes if you, I don't know if they've done a study with specifically alcohol drinking, I saw a recent episode with uh, about alcohol with Huberman. He didn't talk about this, but maybe there is some correlation where if you mess up your liver or if you do something where one of your organs has a shift in their clock. And I know, th I don't know if they've done this with the liver, but I know that they've done studies where if you eat too late at night, there is a phase shift 
because the clock in those organs and in, in, in your digestive system mostly, though that clock will change or, or it will get a bit perturbed because you ate later than what you usually eat. Right. So imagine you're 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 living life, you know, usually last time last meal is five, six PM. You go to sleep at eight, nine PM, let's say in a perfect world. But let's say you decided to take a snack at nine PM. Well, what happened is your digestive system, right? Your stomach, your small intestine, large intestine, right? And everything else associated with that, which is basically your whole body, those th those cells would have a shift in their clock because they were expecting to rest. They were expecting to digest the food, but now they are no longer able to digest. So this is very important. And, and, and now let's, now this goes back to the morning, right? When we, and, and, and when Huberman did this, this talk, I read the book, The Molecule of More. I read the, the Circadian Code, amazing books. You know, soon we'll have uh, uh, these authors on, on our podcast so we can uh, interview them. But what I learned is that, so when I, was, when I was doing my PhD, I learned about the ganglion cells and the photoreceptors inside the retina, right? So our retina, which is in the back of the eye, is the first brain area which allows you to see things, right? The photoreceptors are just, you know, passing light, right? They, they, they catch light and they pass it to your ganglion cells. Some photoreceptors are in charge of more black and white, right? They, they're, they're, they're alive more at night when there's no color. And then some photoreceptors, which are the cones, and there's different types of cones, which allow you to see color. Now, what's interesting is that there is a third type of photoreceptor, which I had no idea about. I read this in these papers that I read with, with, uh, from reading Circadian Code, and these papers are from like 1998, right? Mo 25 years ago, we knew this shit, man. There are uh, uh, photoreceptors known as melanopsin, right? Melanopsin photoreceptors, and there are mel melanopsin ganglion cells which signal to the brain that you are viewing the sun. Right? And, and this is super cool because this is the scientific mechanism which allows your brain to wake up. Right? Whereas before, if, if you don't see the sun, or if you don't get enough light, these melanopsin ganglion cells will not get activated by the photoreceptor in charge of this sunlight. Right? They're, they're specific. It's like a third type of photoreceptor, which is so unbelievably cool. I didn't even know this, man. And my PhD was, you know, 20, 2006 to 2013. So they didn't even teach us this. This is super cool stuff. So this is sort of the mechanism. And what's most important is entrainment. Entrainment is so, imagine you have the suprachiasmatic nucleus having a pattern of spikes. like brr, brr, brr. It's having these pulses. And then you have all the different body organs having their own uh, rhythm, their own clock, right? Brr, brr, brr. When you go in the morning and you look at the sun, that is telling your brain that there is now a synchronization between the circadian rhythm inside of your head and the circadian rhythm that is dictated by sunlight. They're not exactly the same, right? There might be a, a few minutes here and there difference. Because the brain doesn't have a 24-hour clock. It's just a little bit like 23-point-something hour clock. And so that entrainment, that synchronization between the two clocks is what will allow us to have that energy to wake up in the morning. So this is like 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 intense, intense, cool stuff. I want to get a, a bit into... We, we talked a lot about ice bats already in our previous episode, so I'm not going to get into that. But just for people who are watching, if you want to know, you know, the, the morning protocol to wake you up, especially and, and trigger dopamine release, that is not easy. And, and something uh, that you can just get like if you just by scrolling, you know, we recommend ice baths, breath work, exercise and, and, and flexibility, yoga, so on and so forth. But now, Jameson, let's get into some more fun with serotonin. So you are a gut health expert. You know, I've always come to you for gut health issues. 
and uh, especially with people that I love, you know, my family and 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 my my close friends that um, I ask you about about their gut problems and 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 things like that. But when we look at this awesome neurotransmitter serotonin, and a lot of people know serotonin from the you know they they hear it from the 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 gut news, right? Like oh my god, this 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 thing called serotonin. What can you tell us about your experience with serotonin? And, and, and let's also get into SSRIs and how that may affect men and women. Because I know you told me a couple of weeks ago that a lot of your women friends, um, they took SSRIs, they took birth control pills, and they felt a certain way uh, something happened to their hormone levels. So let's talk about serotonin and go deep into this, this uh, very, very awesome molecule. Speaking of serotonin, there's something with sunlight that I found was so interesting when I when I heard people talk about this. I was speaking with Ra, and he was mentioning how when he's out in sunlight, he will notice that he's happier, and he notices it, the feeling in his gut, and he also notices if he wears sunglasses, he gets sunburned much more easily, much more easily, which is the exact same scenario that I've noticed. And I didn't know that that was such a commonplace. I didn't know that was such a popular thing for people to notice or to happen. But he told me about the experience of people, people who fall asleep on the beach, people who fall asleep by the pool, always get the most sunburn. They turn into lobsters, right? And they're the ones who always have the worst sunburn. Or if you don't notice it and you're outside in the sun all day, you end up getting more sunburn. So that was something that I found very intriguing with sunlight because it does allow you to feel good and you go outside and you get sunlight on your skin and your eyes and it just provides this little boost of serotonin which is what is so interesting how it connects to the eyes and then also the gut and the gut is something that i find a lot of my serotonin feeling my feeling of positivity and, and connection with others comes from my gut i just notice it i just feel it there and the brain makes decisions, but the gut is where that, that source of good or bad comes from. And it's very difficult to control, but I've started to work on figuring out how to feel into the gut and how to think positively or to get myself in a positive environment and notice how that changes the gut. So with serotonin, I find that one of the best practices is to understand what your body creates serotonin from and how you feel good and how your gut feels good by what actions and what activities that you partake in throughout the day. So I listen to my gut, right? If I take ice baths, if I, if I do something that is difficult, but then I feel good about it afterwards, I notice that I feel this sense of joy coming from my gut. On the other end of the spectrum, if I feel like something bad is going to happen, or I feel like I'm not doing enough, or I'm in danger, or something just feels bad, or I'm comparing myself to others, I notice my gut has the opposite ability to make me feel like there's a pit in my stomach. And there's a reason why you have these feelings. And I think that they are very profound, but they have a very close tie with serotonin. Because now that we know that we have a connection between our brain and our heart and our gut, the next question is, what are we? what's communicated between those three areas? What kind of information is being sent back and forth? So a lot of it has to do with hormones and a lot of it has to do with your body's sending signals of hormones throughout your heart, brain, and your gut. That's why I'm so excited about serotonin because from what I've observed personally, there seems to be a lot of connection. And now let me know what kind of studies come out with this too, because this is something that I'm trying to figure out the cutting edge of is that feeling of serotonin in my gut and how that affects the serotonin and the SSRI set the, uh, the serotonin receptors in my head and how SSRIs damage that integrity. Now, that's what I've been learning from women that have, like you said, been taking SSRIs and birth control. They feel okay. The pills are doing what they're supposed to do, but they're losing something. With the hormonal birth control, they're losing a sense of their femininity. They're losing a sense of their ability to be attracted to their partners and their ability to be sexually, have sexual desire. And then with the SSRIs, they're losing that feminine nature of being able to 
connect with their surroundings, connect with people, and feel good about what they're doing. They're noticing that they don't have that feeling anymore. Things feel more like, I would say, apathetic. Things just feel normal. There's just kind of just maybe not an ex ex existential dread, but there is this feeling in the background of, okay, this is okay. This is life. This is what it is. But there's not those highs and lows that you normally get used to that provides that character. And especially with women, I've noticed this because there's a lot of feeling with the feminine. There's a lot of feel and they are in tune with their surroundings and their people very well. Whereas men take these feelings and just kind of try and bulldoze over them with hard work, exercise, you know, trying to do the right thing or numb it out with food and entertainment. But with women, they're very good at getting deep into their feelings. And that is one thing I noticed with women who are, who have been taking SSRIs, that their feelings don't really notice or have as much existence anymore. So that's what I want to be able to do some more diving into, because I already know what my own experience is with serotonin and my own experience with my gut and my brain being in that connection. But I want to see what is out there for other people and from just outside of my friend group and what's actually happening when there is serotonin being produced. Is it being produced in the gut? Does the gut also make serotonin? Is it being um, transported to the brain? Is there serotonin from the brain being transported to the gut? These are the kind of questions that I am very curious about with the current state of people's health. Got it. The one thing I will tell you for sure is that most of the serotonin is made from neurons in the gut. Now, a lot of people, you know, if uh, traditionally, and, and even me during my PhD, I was like, I had this belief that, oh, neurons are here. But obviously, we have peripheral nervous system. We have the central nervous system here. We have the peripheral nervous system. You know, there's neurons in the finger. There's neurons in the, in the gut. There's neurons all over the body. So a majority of the serotonin is produced in the gut. And, and for sure, there is a gut-brain axis and they can communicate with each other. What's really cool about serotonin, though, when it comes to uh, these, these problems that people face, right, with anxiety and depression, and SSRIs have been prescribed since the 1970s. So how do they actually work? So let, let's go back a, a second to look at the mechanism of how a receptor uh, takes and accepts a neurotransmitter. So imagine, and, and I explained this in one of the previous podcasts, but I'll do it again. But imagine there is a serotonin, a serotonin neurotransmitter, it gets released, and it now binds to a receptor on this cell, right? And now let's say this cell has an action potential, right? It's spiking, it's spiking. Now at the end of this cell, there is an axon which is how the cell communicates with the next neuron. This axon has what are known as reuptake receptors. They're basically recycling the serotonin that's coming in, right? So imagine this is the neuron that just fired. Now it's releasing serotonin for this neuron to accept, right? Th this neuron has receptors for serotonin. But as serotonin is hanging out in the synaptic cleft, this recycling receptor, which is known as a reuptake receptor, it, it recycles the serotonin back, is if you inactivate this receptor or if you put in something that binds to this receptor so serotonin can't bind, then there will be a lot of serotonin left over in this synaptic cleft or the synapse. Well, this is what SSRIs are doing. They are increasing the serotonin available for these receptors to accept. But here is the issue. There is not really any evidence that more serotonin is gonna alleviate anxiety. Basically none, but this is the best we got, right? In terms of pharmaceutical. But more recently, what has been found, and this is, I learned this from a Huberman um, a lecture on, uh, he, it was a, he did a talk in Port Portland or Seattle and someone asked him from the audience about SSRIs. And I'm going to basically quote him. And he said that 
it's not the and, and I'm paraphrasing uh, what he said. It's not that the it's the increase in serotonin that is doing the work. It is actually the ability of the brain to learn faster. And this is very interesting because if I, I don't know, Jameson, how many psychedelic experiences you've had or or what you've tried, but when people who are undergoing trauma or addiction or, you know, PTSD, you know, whatever that is, they, and now there's, uh, you know, MDMA, uh, ketamine, right? These trials are happening, psilocybin. I think MDMA's, uh, no, ketamine has been approved, I believe, or MDMA has been approved and ketamine is almost approved in phase three trials. And pretty soon what's going to happen is psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, and, and others will be approved for people to alleviate anxiety, alleviate depression, alleviate PTSD. And it's not necessarily that serotonin is increasing. What is happening and most likely, and this is from Huberman, is that the plasticity, the ability of the brain to change, right? This process, it's not like a, a product. It's something that happens gradually, right? Our brain, our brain is plastic. What that means is it has the ability to change basically at any age. Um, I mean, we, we, there are exceptions, obviously, right? And, and, the, and sometimes like language learning will be way harder if you're 100 years old versus when you're three years old or, or when you're one year old. But the fact that the brain is now more plastic, that is why psychedelics, SSRIs, and other processes and other other molecules that are increasing serotonin, it's actually that they may be allowing for greater plasticity. That's what um, I have learned recently. And because we are on the topic of serotonin and we talked about dopamine too, from what I learned in the book, The Molecule of More, fantastic book, amazing book, it's simply that dopamine is the future molecule, right? What can I have more of? What can I do better? What can I do bigger, right? What can I do stronger? It's like future, future, future. Whereas serotonin, prolactin, and oxytocin are the here and now hormones, neurotransmitters. They allow us to feel good in the moment, right? They affect our mood. They affect how happy we feel with what we currently have rather than wanting more. So this is a sort of a very big overview, but, uh, um, and obviously feel free to have any follow-up questions if you have, but I, I would love to get into oxytocin. And uh, oxytocin is, a, is, a, is very, very cool. And, and, and obviously there's a lot of myths associated with oxytocin as like anything else. But um, tell me your experience with, because one thing we do know from, you know, from the person who's watching right now, if you're addicted to porn and you are chronically facing this problem of, 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 of even like scrolling Instagram and looking at that type of porn or TikTok, and you are basically masturbating and, 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 and ejaculating, you don't have much oxytocin activation. So, Jameson, let's get into that, man. What, what is your experience and your knowledge about oxytocin and what can someone do to have that sort of uh, love and bond that oxytocin stimulates? See, out of these hormones, oxytocin is probably one of the most difficult, but also one of the most rewarding and a very important for bonding and has a lot of important effects on being able to create a deep bond with someone and releasing those hormones, whether it be through family, through close friends, through relationships. Oxytocin is very tough. That's, that's why a lot of men and women have issues with, with breakups, have issues with um, socializing interactions, intimacy. And there's a lot that is being connected when you are releasing that hormone for a good reason because it's protecting you. I find that you can't really synthesize it. Unlike dopamine, 
it's very hard to synthesize unorganically. It is something that has to come naturally. And maybe you can develop a really intimate relationship with a band or a influencer, and that provides you some oxytocin. But for the most part, a lot of the oxytocin is going to come from a real life scenario. And it's going to be very noticeable, but it's probably going to be one of the lesser experienced hormones, depending on your lifestyle, depending on if you're around your family or not. One of the first things that I think of when I think of oxytocin is just hugging people you love more and hugging strangers, being able to go up to your friends. And when you see them, just to hug them, when you meet someone, give them a hug. It allows you to have that bond with that person, especially long hugs. They allow you to connect with a person on a deeper level and you can both release oxytocin in that way. And that provides not only a good feeling, but also provides the health benefits that come with that sense of bonding, that security, that safety is satiated. Now, I don't think oxytocin has to be correlated with intercourse at all. I think it's very focused on bonds and relationships. Um, I think that there may be something to do with people being able to have intercourse without oxytocin, which kind of goes hand in hand with the issues of the pornography and the infinite scrolling that people are so accustomed to because they are so focused on pleasure that they don't really care about what else is happening behind the scenes. And I find that oxytocin is almost fleeting. So when it comes, I appreciate it and I appreciate the hugs. And I appreciate giving love. But there are times I don't have it and I have to be okay with that. And it's very beneficial learning experience for me because like, learning with my dopamine experience, instead of being like, oh man, I want dopamine right now. I'm going to go get it with oxytocin. It's more of, I want oxytocin right now, but I know that it's going to require me to go meet someone or go see a friend or go outside and experience a relationship with, with someone else. And then there also is a sense of self-love and I feel a lot of oxytocin whenever I have a moment of gratitude if I'm doing something that I feel like I'm very happy about it. And I feel like it's something that is providing myself love, right? Just like you've talked about before, you've talked about giving yourself love in the form of taking care of your body, taking care of your nutrition, doing something really exciting, something like making a badass pod, recording things with people and doing things with people you care about, having a conversation with people you care about, being able to live a lifestyle. If you're reading a book that you really get a lot of information from and you feel really good that you're learning something. I feel like the self-love is important and needs to be appreciated more. I think self-love is undervalued. And of course you have the hippies who are all about self-love and then you have others who are egotistical and their self-love is the form of, I am the better than everyone else, which is not really self-love at all. It's more of, um, being able to ostracize yourself from other people. So if you can take self-love as a, a point of actions to yourself, whether it be rubbing your body in a way that just feels good to it, a massage on a muscle that you need some extra help with, maybe being a, in the shower, being able to appreciate rubbing soap on your body. Like there's a lot of self-love that is overlooked. So when oxytocin comes up, I always want to emphasize on self-love because people think oxytocin has to do with intimacy in your partner. And I think that the two most important things I find for oxytocin are going to be hugging people you care about and are going to be treating yourself to acts of self-love. Yeah. The one thing I will say about that is um, when you when you really look deeper into the oxytocin literature, what you find is that it's not it's not just released on very simple things. It takes, it takes a real, real intense bond to trigger oxytocin. So, for example, when you mentioned the hugs, I don't know if they've done this specific study, but a hug with someone you deeply love, and you know, you mentioned that the long hug when you you're heart to heart, you're breathing. That pair bond may 
or may not trigger oxytocin release. Just, just from the literature, it's not so easy, right? People are like, oh, I got oxytocin release. No, it's not like that. Now, oxytocin will be released in an orgasm, right? As prolactin is released in an orgasm and, uh, and serotonin is released in an orgasm. So this is something important, right? So when you are making love and you're, you're having sex with your partner and, and in this intimate relationship and you get an orgasm, that pair bonding, that, that, uh, what, what in, in the molecule of more, it's known as companion love, companionate love from like the lusty love, or which is like all about body and, 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 and material animal stuff to companionate love. And she talks about how for couples to have a relationship for a long time, there has to be this shift from lusty, only body animal love to this companionate love where you feel sexual arousal just from their voice or from them caressing you, you know, the nurturing, the loving, the the doing activities together. So this companionate love is very oxytocin uh, dependent. So this is something uh, uh, scientific to, to know. Another one, which is even more interesting, is that they've done a study where they looked at the oxytocin, uh, and I read this in a, in a Robert Sapolsky book, uh, they've looked at how a dog and his owner, when they look in each other's eyes, can trigger oxytocin release, which is incredible. The fact that another species of animal can trigger oxytocin release because we love that being, that dog, which is so cool, man. This is a, this is a recent finding about, about dog and human. And another thing I want to uh, tell you is that they've actually invented an oxytocin nasal spray. And uh, they've done studies where they, they bring in couples with fMRI machines, and I think they're doing surveys and stuff. And they ask questions, you know, how much do you love each other and, and how much do you trust each other? Because oxytocin is also a trust hormone, right? It's a trust thing as well. So they, you know, they ask a bunch of questions and then they're doing fMRI imaging. So this is like uh, neuroimaging studies. And they found that just this nasal oxytocin spray makes you trust the person more, makes you love the person more, makes you feel more comfortable with the other person. And get lots of different uh, metrics that they looked at. And I'm paraphrasing here. But oxytocin is that powerful. And it's sad because if you look at our current um, technology, sort of our, our, you know, technology is never the, the enemy. It's how we use technology. So it's very sad because when we look at people scrolling infinitely and, and being trapped or even the, uh, you know, old people at the casino pulling the slot machine uh, all day or, or pressing, uh, now they don't even have to pull a lever. They just like press the, the button all the time. Um, you see that and, and there is this, there's this sense of hormonal disruption, hormonal desynchronization, where what you used to do is you would get this very harmonious, melodic interplay of hormones and neurotransmitters in your body, right? You would you would uh, fall in love with your partner. You know, there's foreplay and touchy touchy, kissy kissy, and then there's intercourse and there's uh, you, you lie there in bed with them and you, you take a shower together, whatever, and that sense of love and 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 traditional uh, a bond has been very disrupted by you know the adult film industry, the porn industry, social media industry, and Netflix and 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 TikTok and and sort of the display of women in a in a in a way that is not really aligned with the traditional values of basically human beings. So this this is something very interesting, and and we we can talk more about that. But uh, I want to get a sense from you of, and and we did not touch on this in the last podcast, and I did want to touch on it. What is your sense of how the human brain, especially of men, is being shaped when you look at shallow versus deep? Right. So for example, you look at something. 
like a tree. Oh, it's a tree, and you keep going. But if you were to go deeper, which our ancestors did for sure, you see that tree as a sense of giving you sustenance and life, giving you the oxygen you need to live, right? Giving you plants and fruits and, and you name it, right? I mean, we're drinking coconut water here every single day, right? Fresh coconut water. But then what happens is when we look at ourselves, we also see ourselves as shallow, right? Like, oh, do I have a six pack? Do I have big biceps? Uh, do I, am I wearing a, you know, Giorgio Armani shirt? Am I wearing a, a Gucci shoes, right? You, you get a sense of this. So Jameson, take me through your mentality of how do you restrain yourself from seeing things in a shallow way? Because for me, reading Marcus Aurelius' Meditations and, and, and really paying attention to Stoic philosophy, I have now, basically, I value a few things big time. One thing I value is play, fun, being in enjoyment, right? So when I interact with someone or when I interact with a, even an animal or nature or when I go hug a tree, it is with a sense of fun, with a sense of the unknown. It's a sense of humility, like, wow, this is so cool, right? But then there's also this sense of gratitude, this, this sense of, hey, I am just thankful to be here. So how do you take a look at, you know, oxytocin and serotonin, these feel-good hormones and mood, and, and how do you really bond with something in a deeper way rather than seeing things in a very shallow way? Because our society today is sort of promoting the shallow, right? Oh, you text someone, you're ugly. You're not looking at them. You're not bit making eye contact with them, you are not paying attention to their heart, to their feelings. You are seeing things. I mean, even right now as I look at you, right? You are my buddy. I know who you are. I can feel your energy here. But you are not in person, right? It's not like I cannot hug you, right? You, you are virtual. You're, you're somewhere else. So do I, are we missing something? Are our hormonal physiology, our endocrine system, is it missing something from seeing something as shallow rather than deep? Mm. Going deep. Always the invitation to go deeper. I like that. And there are a lot of things that I live, ways that I live that correlate with that. Some I'm aware of and some I'm not aware of. And there's also a lot of times where I notice that I don't live in that moment. And I look around and I don't enjoy the things I'm around, right? I'll look at things and I'll look at it in spite or as something that's bad or out of line. And it's very easy to focus on the issues, right? If there's trash around, if there's bad weather or something that's bothering you in the environment, it's a lot easier to notice those things, right? Because they, they get a rise out of you versus being in a moment where you can appreciate everything around you and not rushing. You don't get as much of a rise of something that's just not natural of you. You see a tree, you see something beautiful. It's not going to be as prominent as something that gets a rise out of you, which would either be something bad or an attractive person or an accident or something dangerous, something scary, someone doing something interesting, whether it's embarrassing or exciting. There's a reason why those things excite us so much. There's a reason why those things are so tantalizing and polarizing for us, right? We notice those things out of safety and we notice those differences out of safety. But the beautiful things, we don't really get to notice as much because it doesn't have a lot to do with our short-term safety. What I've been practicing is the ability to enjoy noticing my breathing and when I start to notice my breathing, the world around me becomes a lot more noticeable. I'll notice trees around me. I'll notice the sky above me. I remember talking to someone last week and they asked me, what was the last time you looked up in the sky? The last time you just looked up and, and just stared in the sky. And I couldn't tell them when I was looking at the sky last, like when I just looked up. 
I can definitely remember that I probably looked down a few times that day, whether if it was to protect my eyes, if it was to look at my shoes, if it was to do something, but I don't remember looking up. And that stuck with me because it reminded me that there's a lot happening around me in all directions. And I'm so single tracked on what's in front of me and what's happening on my screen, what's happening with people around me that there's a lot of things that I'm not taking in. And I don't have to stress myself out and worry about not taking those things in. But it was very exciting to be aware of that, that how many things are happening when I'm on the street, how many beautiful things are happening around me that I don't even get to appreciate. And that thought just got me excited about everything happening around me, all the beauty around me and the clouds and the environment and the sunlight that I don't really get to think of all the time. But just being able to be aware and going back to the breath and knowing that those are around me at all times is a very consoling feeling. It feels very protective and it feels safe. So I'm using the natural instinct of my body to feel safe, but instead of looking at it from a negative connotation of that person is doing something embarrassing, that person is doing something dangerous, that person looks dangerous, I need to protect myself from them. I think of the positivity of safety, this environment that I'm around, the ability to have these trees around me, the, the ability to have a direct connection to the earth, the things that are protecting my body and making me healthier. So shifting from that, that natural instinct is not easy to do, but it has a lot of benefits in long-term allocations for what your day-to-day -day life is going to be like. A lot of people go through life with such a mundane viewpoint on things and they don't look at things very clearly because there's so much, there's so much intake that we can get, especially being in a city being in a place where there's no go pathways and the desire to look at something and the desire to change your field of vision because something that caught your eyes is looking nice, something smells good, some food. There's so many easy ways to be distracted. Some person's walking on the street that you like to look at. Someone is causing a scene somewhere. Someone's saying something. You see someone you know, you get excited. But behind all of that is just this ability to be here on earth in a place where I can connect to the ground, I can get sunlight, I can look at the trees, I can touch the trees. And it's kind of basically like being a civilized hippie. You're balancing that sense of life and being able to appreciate all of the crazy things in life while also realizing what is here naturally and what it's doing for your health and how it's actually improving your way of life versus just overlooking it and just assuming that it's always going to be there or not, not appreciating it because then you get into a mindset that just becomes a vicious cycle of detriment and, and maybe turns into self hate. So whenever I'm in that environment, I really try to be aware of gratitude in that moment. And I like to talk to myself too. That's always a fun thing to do. I'll talk out loud. I'll be like, that's a cool tree. I'll just say random things just so I'm like consciously shifting my mindset to things around me that are very simple. And sometimes that might be embarrassing or scary, but it's a really good practice for me other than the breath to get back into the center and just tune in to what's happening around me in a positive way and not to be in such a sense of needing to check my phone wanting to get to the destination, just wanting to get this over with and just trying to get to where I'm supposed to be or trying to find a certain person or look for a particular thing or go to a certain place like it's a task. That's one of my favorite parts is just taking everything in verbally and appreciating things verbally as a reminder to myself of what's around me. And it's funny too, because I you know, look kind of crazy walking around commenting on things that I like, but it's a very positive practice that works really well for my personality. Yeah. Kids do it all the time. Kids are talking to them Inner child. all the time, buddy. Inner child. Yeah. Totally it's normal. Being able to get to the play, just like you mentioned, the play and the inner child are very fun and they allow us to be curious 
and they allow us to just look at things in a new light. Yeah. You, you mentioned personality and this is something cool because, um, what they found is people who are like you and I, right? We are extroverted. We like to talk to people. We like to look around. We are very sort of, um, we are curious to stimulate ourselves and learn new things and experience new events. And what they found is it is because of a, we need more dopamine to satisfy our physiology, right? So you can imagine someone who has, you get this feeling of satisfaction when you get enough of a dopamine hit in your receptors, right? So now what does it have to do with? That has to do with the amount of dopamine present in the synapse. It has to do with the number of dopamine receptors you have. It also depends on how well dopamine binds to these receptors is known as the binding affinity, right? How tight it binds and, 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 and what it does after that, right? The effects after that. So for people like us, what is basically happening is that we don't have as efficient a dopamine system. We just need more dopamine to get the happiness and satisfaction. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. This is just how the mechanism works. And the thing you said about the sky, this is a very interesting topic because for me, I used to be just like you, where I would not pay attention to the sky. I don't know what the hell the sky looks like. Who gives a fuck, right? But now with Martha, who, uh, my girlfriend, who is extremely into noticing things that I don't notice, right? So she'll be like, hey, baby, look at the sky. Look how cute it is. Look, look at how pink it is. Look how blue it is. And now what I've started doing, especially when I'm in my bike, I catch myself looking at the sky all the time. And I see, wow, this is like a, a pastel color or, oh, look, look at how cool the sun is shining. And look, look at this pinkish, like this morning, on my way to the gym. And even yesterday we saw it like a kind of pink sky, which was really beautiful. So seeing the beauty in things day to day, and you are right. The nasal breathing for me is also a very important protocol that keeps me in the moment. And it also allows me to recognize my own body being here and that in itself is the most beautiful thing the fact that our body our being is here it's phenomenal so yeah man I, i'm totally with you the nasal breathing helps a lot the, the the mouth taping and and whatnot and that feminine energy of noticing beauty right seeing art in a museum or simply seeing how beautiful a tree is or how beautiful an, an ant is. You know, all the time when we see ants, we go down and we see that, you know, a bunch of ants would they'll be like carrying this big object on their shoulders. It's like a Gulliver's Travels book, right? And they're like carrying this giant, like what the hell, where the hell are they going? And they're like, they'll be able to go vertical and they'll, they'll like dodge things and they're so clever. And that noticing that beauty of an ant colony knowing exactly what they're doing. I believe this is the key. This is the key to removing anxiety. This is what I believe. And let me tell you how this works. So when, when I was um, with RSD and when I was super into pickup culture and I was all the time you know, when I would see a girl, I would always go and approach and talk to her and I would try to get her number and, and try to go on a date and so on and so forth, right? It was a lot of fun. This type of thing was a lot of fun. But one thing that, one huge profound thing that this made my, wi my wiring in my brain, what happened is I started seeing people for what I could get out of them, for the shallowness of them, right? Because it's like, you know, you're taught that, oh, women are only necessary for their beauty. And that's it. And that's all that matters. And I beg to differ. I think this is a very ridiculous and, and, and stupid statement. 
because from my experience, when you go in deep and you go deeper into someone, and, and this could be a friend, this could be your pet, this could be a book, this could be the, the tree, this could be the, the sand, this could be the beach. When you go deeper into nature and you really feel through a very balanced hormonal system, and you can feel these optimal hormones in your body when you live. When you feel that, the gift of seeing the fun and the beauty and the, and the play in everything you do makes everything else easier. So rather than having the anxiety of, hey, I need X or I must listen to my thought, or I must engage in this activity because of the tyrant in my brain. Once you start seeing the play, once you start seeing things in their beauty, and even when you see your own brain as a beautiful thing that is evoking these thoughts, you begin to recognize that these are all permanent, these are all temporary things that are going to die one day. They're going to go away one day. They're going to deteriorate one day. So one thing I really love to do is pay attention to what is permanent, right? And I, and I want to get your thoughts on this too, because, you know, we, we are, we have come from a porn addiction background, right? I was addicted for about 20 years. I don't know how many years you were addicted for, but we have come from this wiring in the brain where women are objectified. They are very, looked at as objects, hey, this is something I can have. This is something that I can satisfy my animalistic nature with. And we miss, and, and, and I don't miss it anymore, thank God, you know, I'm able to appreciate what love is and, and feel that. But for, for basically, you know, 40 years of my life, I was in this objectifying, what transaction can I have with this person? And, uh, uh, Many, many, many uh, horrible mathematical calculations I used to do. Like, like for example, one math uh, uh, equation I did with one of my friends in Montreal, I still remember, we were walking on Saint Laurent, which is a party street there, and we thought that, hey, um, let's say that you uh, married someone. Let's do a calculation of how much money this would cost over a span of 50 years and then we would calculate that, oh, if you like spend this much money at a club to get laid, or if you like hired a prostitute and, 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 and had sex with her, let's do like a mathematical equation and, and solve the arithmetic here to see if marriage is even worth it. And that type of ridiculous, even if it's in a joking manner, and we weren't joking, by the way, we were very serious. It, even if it is in a joking manner, you've given your brain the ability to go there, right? To see people as an object. And then you see yourself as an object. You see yourself as, oh, I am on this planet to make money. I am on this planet to, uh, uh, you know, we talked about this in our previous podcast about the myths, right? Like, oh, to sleep with a lot of girls. I'm on this planet to uh, uh, see, uh, uh, have other people adore me and, and me get famous. So, Jameson, from your perspective, what, what have you done in your life to see the beauty of the world, not just in women and nature, but also in yourself, in books, in technology, in, in uh, breath, in just water, and, and, and being able to walk in nature? Like, what creative art and beauty have you noticed in yourself and what has really helped you get away from this transactional point of view that oh i just want to have this from this person into more i love this person i appreciate this person and all of this other mumbo jumbo that has been wired in my head is simply commercialized it's simply something that someone can profit from someone can gain from and then i will lose from you do end up losing financially and emotionally 
I find that my favorite experiences come from a place of full expression and they come from a place of not caring about other people when it comes to what they think about what I'm doing and their reaction to me. It comes from full body expression. And that's interesting to say because a lot of sexual things are full body expressions. And a lot of that happens to be in an issue where people do things, you know, impulsively and they get into trouble because they want to fulfill this animalistic urge within their body. But the most enjoyment I've had is being able to fully express myself in a creative sense, whether it be writing or it be acting out through my body. It has all been done maybe with others around me, but it's all been done with me. I haven't needed anybody else to facilitate that experience and or anyone else to be there to cause that experience to happen. Some of the most euphoric memories I've had are through breath work, through being able to express myself creatively with my friends, doing things like perennium sunning, being able to do film, filming different projects that are very silly and being able to express myself in that, in that sense of full body play. So a lot of men are stuck in that mindset of needing to get pleasure from women which I understand because there's a lot of beautiful memories that come from that pleasure, but there's also a beautiful sense of appreciation that comes from being able to create or being able to study, being able to research, being able to dive into something and, and tinker with things like you say, and experience that and, and get value out of being able to learn something. So it's funny you mentioned the story of being able to do all the the arithmetic and the mathematics behind getting married versus just going out and getting girls, right? Because it's so easy, especially as a masculine man, to look at two things on the same field, right? We look at the value of what we're getting out of this, and it's going to be purely sexual and pleasurable. So if we look at things from a pleasure perspective, then we are doing the math with the same outcome on each end. But now that we know about what's happening from a chemical level, not just oxytocin, but also on an energetic level when you're sharing your life with someone and expressing your true emotions with someone and you're connecting with someone on a level where you're, if you're socially having sex with people, you have to break up with them in a way. And that's a lot of damage on your emotions and it makes it difficult on how you're feeling and it hurts. It just hurts as a man. Some men can get over that and push that feeling down. But for a lot of men, there is a sense of maybe guilt, maybe shame, but a lot of it comes from hurt with women and they feel this sense of, I feel like I'm doing something wrong. And maybe afterwards they feel like they are leading the person on and they just don't feel good about it. There's just a sense of knowing what's right for most people. So the sense of knowing what's right comes as an additional cost that you can't mathematize and bring it into numbers and, and quantify and quantify this, this, new it's like looking at um physics right if you look at physics there's newtonian physics which are very simple to understand and, and simple to use equations with and to you know f equals ma like all the physics background but then there's quantum physics and there's the ability to look at things from a whole different perspective and bring new equations most of which we aren't even aware of that have so many rules and uncertainties that they're not really even effective as equations that we would get with building something and using Newtonian physics. So this, the sense of the emotional toll that these relationships have on us is not quantifiable yet. So therefore in our brains and our man brains, we don't really worry about them because we don't see them as something that incorporates into the big picture, right? For us, it's okay. We either slept with a girl or we didn't, and we either spent money or we didn't. And those are both quantifiable, but there's a ton of qualifiable things that are just like obscure, but have a huge effect on our overall well-being and our overall mood, our overall health, mental health, physical health. It all has an effect on that, but we can't take that to the equation yet because it's not obvious. There's no number that 
proves that this is the way it is and this will have this much of an impact and this will have this much of an impact. But we know it's there because we feel it, right? We can sense it in our bodies. We sense it in our emotions. We sense it in our relationships. If we have a bad relationship versus a good relationship, we can tell that the bad relationship causes us to feel like this and the good relationship causes us to feel like that. That is where men really have to focus in on and understand that there is more to the situation than what beats the eye and being able to tap into that feminine nature of a man, feel into what's actually happening behind the scenes, within your body, within your gut, within your heart, and stop worrying about what's happening in your brain and trying to find a solution to everything. And I know Andre and I have spoken about this as well. He's a very smart, um, experienced person in this sense of, okay, I'm a, I'm a gym guy. I'm a gym bro. How do I get to be in the best physical shape? Macronutrients, count your macros, and go to the gym, follow this workout routine, follow this lifting program. Boom, 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 boom. And you try and get results that way. But as we now learned, macronutrients are only a very small part of the equation. There's micronutrients as well. And there's also the importance of what effects these micronutrients have on our food craving, have on our mood, have on our well-being. Maybe we can still build muscle that way, but we're not going to be able to be as healthy as we possibly can be if we just look at everything like it's an equation. Speaking of um, looking at everything in terms of an equation, uh, there is this equation that says that uh, DHT is 10 times more powerful than T. And this has to do with the androgen receptor and the binding affinity. So for those of you who want to know the physiology, testosterone ends up binding to an androgen receptor. And that is how the effect of testosterone takes place. But DHT, dihydrotestosterone, can also bind to this androgen receptor. And the math shows that it's about a 10 times the potency, the effect on the androgen receptor from DHT. Now, my question to you, Jameson, is that a lot of men are assuming that if they get rid of their DHT, right, that their serum DHT, their blood, they will stop losing hair and they will, um, or they will regrow their hair, right? So there's this thought that DHT equals hair loss on the head and DHT equals hair growth on the beard. And now there are drugs available that um, reduce your DHT levels. And some guys have gone, you know, very dramatic with these drugs and, and, and taken it for years and years. And so please tell me about your experience with who you, the people you've talked to, your clients and so on, our Afro D Nation community. And what exactly is DHT? What is it important for? And is it, is, is it worth reducing DHT to not lose hair? Good question. Dihydrotestosterone. It is almost shamed because it's something men are afraid of. Losing hair is something men are very afraid of. But DHT has more than just effects on hair. Not only does it have homeostasis for your body, your hormone levels, and if you start messing with that, the rest of your body will try and compensate for you exogenously going in there and interfering with your natural production. But it also has an effect on your libido. And now I have friends who are my age, who are younger than me actually, who are taking things in order to grow their hair. What are they taking? In order to keep their hair growth. Taking things like finasteride, um, medox medoxamil, taking things like that in order to keep their hair growth. I had friends who offered to put, you know, hair. One of my friends was really funny. He said, Oh, you should, you should put, um, what is it called? Medoxidil right here. Minoxidil, minoxidil. Cream. Yeah, minoxidil. Yeah, minoxidil. Put a little cream right oh, here so your beard will grow in fuller right here. Your beard will grow in fuller because on this side it's full and on this side Who gives a it's not as full. I didn't care. But it's interesting how that is a um, possibility for men. It's so easy, not even like worrying about like the aesthetics of it, but just the possibility of it being something that men want to do what, what type of, so readily. What type of man wants to do this? Like, why would a man care? What type because of it's man like, would care? It's like checking off a box. 
it's it's cool it's like it's like oh i can do this and i get a result it's fun men want to do this like drugs men want to do something and then you feel a certain way it's it's an exciting thing that's why a lot of men go into doing um certain drugs especially drugs that are going to be putting them on trips and psychedelics because they're excited to get a result right they're excited to experience something different but what type of what sorry to interrupt man what type of man doesn't care the type of men that don't care are the men who are happy with the way that they are and are okay feeling the way that they feel or looking the way that they look, which I believe is probably the most masculine of men because most super masculine men aren't going to go out of the way to try to prove things to other people because they don't have to get a sense of self-accomplishment and self-beauty and self-love externally. Got it. So let's go back to finasteride and minoxidil. So Take us through what, what what sort of um, effects will happen. Are there side effects? If you know the mechanisms, if we know what they are, what is going on with, and then what, what do they do to DHT? What's going on? From a biological standpoint, when you're taking something like finasteride, especially orally, it is going to decrease your body's natural production of this androgen. And DHT along with estrogen, which also people are something people are trying to naturally decrease, have an impact on your libido. And not just your libido, but also the impact on your hormones, how your face looks, you know, things like your muscle growth, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But for the most part, it's pretty detrimental. There's a very small reward for a very high risk. It's very superficial. Just like looking at men who want to improve their muscular musculature by decreasing their estrogen levels and taking a some kind of serum selective selective and estrogen receptor molecule something that just doesn't allow their body to optimize its own estrogen and they do this because they think it'll give them a little edge in the gym bodybuilders like to do this because it gives them a little bit more of a muscly look grows muscle more easily but it comes with the side effects just like taking something like finasteride. Not only does it come with the side effects of decreasing, possibly decreasing your libido, and my friends who have taken it who are in their young 20s are like, ah, it doesn't really affect my libido but yet. But there's also the side of it where you are trying to solve something in a very unnatural way. You also have to and, take it your whole life, right? If you stop, right. your hair will go, right. be gone. Okay. You have to stick to it. You have to make sure that you take it consistently. Now that's the super, that's like the, the, the surface level look of it, right? There's side effects, health side effects, and then there's results most likely. The part that I get into here, and this is why I focus on being so natural is that you're starting to teach your body that it's okay to circumvent natural scenarios, natural situations in order to feel better about yourself, right? So pray, for example, I wanted to be taller and I've had this thought before too. I want to be tall. A lot of guys want to be tall. Interesting. And they, they wear But you are tall. Still. You still want to be tall. Exactly. Exactly. It's crazy. That's, a, that's another man thing. You know, just like when my friend was mentioning like, uh, hey man, you should put some Madoxanil on your beard right here. And I was like, that's the, f I've never been in a position where I've been like thinking about my beard in that way because I'm so used to just being able to just grow a large beard and not worrying about that. And then they mentioned that and it's like, that's funny. Like, even at this mindset, like if I were like in a position where I was self-conscious, I would have treated that a lot differently because I would have been like, oh shoot, I want to do that. I want to, you know, have the best beard and look the best and do the most I can. I want to have the hairline, the best hairline. And for me, I actually noticed like two years ago, I took a photo and I noticed that the top of my hair, that was fine, but it's like the, the top of my hair was like thinner than the rest of my hair, right? So I didn't look at this as a negative. I looked at this as a really cool opportunity to try hair masks. So I literally started doing egg yolks and apple cider vinegar and putting these different things in my hair and letting them grow my hair, giving my hair natural hormones um, in order to grow my hair. And I had fun doing it because like, you know, you get like the peptides from the eggshells and I was eating more oysters for the zinc. And lo and behold, my hair was fine. And now it, you know, looks normally the same across the whole place. I didn't know if what, I was to, what my issue was was environmental. If my issue was maybe just I was shampooing or 
using too much hot water. But I do know that I noticed a difference and I was like, what the heck am I doing going to do to change it? So I decided to experiment with it naturally and it got back to fine. It was normal. And I thought that was very interesting because what if I was self-conscious enough to take a drug that was going to affect me for the rest of my life, possibly lower my libido just because I noticed something that I was self-conscious of. That's the part that scares me. Like why this sense of experimentation in men is so valuable and it is so cool that we get to be able to experiment and have the desire to experiment and, and learn new things and learn about our body that it's kind of sad when we have this situation where, and you, you avoid that. You just take a new drug, you take something to feel a certain way and the experimentation is gone. You don't get to experience that on your own. You don't get to try new things. You don't get to research things. You don't get to look at things for what it can do in the long term versus just trying to do whatever is going to get you the results you want as fast as possible and get that instant gratification, which is why a lot of the things I talk about always root back to delayed gratification versus instant gratification. I think instant gratification is very damaging. It has its time and place, but delayed gratification provides you with long-term benefits that your future self is going to thank you for. Totally, man. I totally understand. Totally agree. Um, one hormone that um, we, I mean, we kind of touched on estrogen. Let's get deeper into that. Now, the the thing you said about DHT is super important. That the fact that it's not just the libido that will be affected, but also your energy levels. And of course, libido and energy. I mean, they're pretty related. It would be hard to have like very high energy, but like your libido is low. Generally, men who have a low libido also lack energy. I mean, a hard time waking up in the morning, a um, hard time maybe going to sleep at night, hard time going through the day without coffee. I mean, all these problems can happen. And, and, and DHT is, you know, when people take finasteride, dutasteride, and, and other molecules, I'm sure there's peptides available now for this stuff, um, they also have sexual dysfunction. And this is definitely something that has been anecdotally reported as well as reported in the papers. So now, oh yeah, and and um, minoxidil is a different mechanism. They, so minoxidil, is, it's a funny story. This is how uh, scientific research and, and experiments happen where you discover something by accident, right? So like Viagra was a blood pressure pill and they, all these men who were taking this blood pressure pill uh, to increase blood flow, they wouldn't give the Viagra back. And the, the doctor's like, what the hell's going on? Why aren't they giving it back? It's like, oh, okay, they got erections. So now they, you know, the $20 billion industry of, of Viagra. Uh, with minoxidil, it was also related to blood pressure. And what was, um, it was also, you know, in increasing blood flow, reducing blood pressure. And it was a calcium channel opener. That's what uh, this minoxidil, this uh, minoxidil drug did, and then eventually, what would happen is these men who took minoxidil, for whatever reason, they noticed that their hair was growing or they had a lower hair loss and so on, and that's how minoxidil became Rogaine, and Rogaine is, you know, the rest is history. It's probably the oldest FDA-approved drug in history. So that's sort of the the DHT. But now let's go on to estrogen, right? You mentioned briefly that. A lot of men, they have this thought that, oh, let me reduce estrogen to zero. Let me do, you know, there's like a dim supplement that's available, which is like, uh, I think, uh, uh, broccoli and, and, and it's like compounds in broccoli is an extract and it's called dim, I believe. You can talk more about that. But what is estrogen? Why is it important for men or dis, you know, unimportant or, or harmful for men? And how can one know that they have an optimal level of estrogen? Estrogen is another androgen, and it has a very important role in the body for being able to create the, the um, homeostasis of your hormones, of your, your ability to put on muscle, have libido, have emotions. There's a very strong benefit to being able to release estrogen and a lot of the supplements like the serms are tanking the estrogen levels and men who are on the serms 
are finding that their testosterone levels are incredibly low and they are having issues with their testosterone. So men are thinking that not having estrogen is going to improve their testosterone levels when in fact, it actually is a very important role in your full hormone panel and your androgens because it is part of the entire system that allows your body to create those hormones and to show your body how much of the hormones it needs, how much to produce. So when you take estrogen exogenously, you know, men who take estrogen exogenously, they have issues where they get, you know, man boobs and they get other effects that are not very exciting for men, right? A lot of men are afraid of having man boobs. They're afraid of taking too much estrogen. They're afraid of eating soy because they think it's going to make them feminine, right? But it's kind of like TRT. If you take it exogenously, your body is going to have to compensate for that. And when you take estrogen exogenously, your body's going to need to compensate for that too. However, if you are creating estrogen naturally within your body through the pathways it's meant to be created by, your body is going to use it for what it needs to be used for. And it's going to make enough so it's not excess. So it's not in an excess that's going to cause your hormones to develop breasts, but it's also going to be in a position where it is not non-existent and your body is not going to be able to use it for what it needs to use for, i.e. getting yourself a libido, getting yourself to to get turned on and get aroused to develop relationships with people. And the bodybuilders who take this have said that a lot of the side effects of not having estrogen is they become very depressed and there's a lot of just lack of feeling within their body. I mean, literally too, they're not being able to get an erection, but taking these supplements is something that is becoming more popular in the bodybuilding scene. And it's funny because men are afraid of too much estrogen. They're always afraid of eating soy and getting man boobs, but it's a lot harder to eat soy and get man boobs because that takes a lot of work, right? That's a lot of years of consistent damage. But if you start supplementing and depleting your estrogen levels, it can happen very quickly, like a very fast shift in your body's ability to go from good hormonal balance down to hormonal dysfunction because of that extreme shift. Now, too much estrogen isn't a great thing either, but that takes time. Man boobs develop over time, and that's a lifestyle choice. People live a life where they're eating so much crappy food and getting into a position where they just don't have optimal hormones, which is why, going back to one of our first points, you should check in on your hormone levels and get tested with your hormone panel just to see what's happening and what's going on with under the hood in your body. Because if you don't look at it for a while, those kind of things develop. So that's a good way to scare men into getting their hormones tested is something could be wrong and you won't know about it for another 10 years, but you might be overweight and have man boobs in 10 years and not know why because you think you were doing everything right. So estrogen, I would say, is another one where it doesn't need to be feared. And people, when they fear things, it's kind of funny because it's usually they fear, they fear it but because they fear, they, they try and get rid of it. Whereas the excess is what they should be afraid of. But instead of trying to optimize their lifestyle in order to prevent the excess, they just want to get rid of it in general, which is another guy thing to do, right? It's like a binary, it's zero or one. It's either I have too much estrogen, I have no estrogen. There's no healthy medium. And the important part with DA, DA, like dihydrotestosterone and estradiol is to have a healthy medium that's in harmony with your body's hormone panel. Got it. You you also mentioned TRT, and we know um, that a lot of men who take testosterone injections, they try to increase their testosterone levels, or they take androgel, which is a gel you rub on your on your chest to increase testosterone. But injections, you know, from what we've seen in the studies, work way better than the gel. And I think uh, Ab Ab Abby V, who made androgel, they got sued. I I, I I read I read their patent, and then I read their lawsuit as well. Anyway, so with the TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, um, what would you suggest someone who is, let's say, in their 60s or their 70s and they have low testosterone, maybe it, let's say it's 200 nanograms per deciliter and, um, you know, let's say their free testosterone is something like one 
um, the one or, or let, let's say it's two nanograms per deciliter, right? Let's say it's 1%. Um, and so if a person has tried everything, or may or they think they've tried everything, right? They think though, may, you know, maybe they saw some fad like, oh, you need to eat a uh, uh, lot of oysters, and then you'll get increase in testosterone. Or you need uh, maybe if you eat a lot of leafy greens, and maybe the person turns vegan or whatever, right? What do you tell a sixty-year-old who is convinced that they lost hope? There is nothing else for them. And they just are in a very depressed um, uh, world. And may maybe they are taking SSRIs. Maybe they are drinking alcohol. Maybe they are um, uh, hurting themselves through through um, malevolence and resent. And so, what do you tell someone like that? Is there any hope, or is uh, are we done? And they just have to do TRT, and that's it. <laughs> The funny thing about TRT is it actually does have a use and it's a rare case, but certain people do need to take TRT when they have certain issues with their own natural production because their body isn't able to create the hormones. And ironically, that's kind of what happens when you take TRT for a long time. You almost take the pits, you take it and then you cause yourself the need to take it. But people have that issue naturally. So if you're naturally unable to produce testosterone, then exogenous testosterone is, is going to be necessary in order for that. But a six-year-old man who's lived his life in harmony, creating testosterone with his body, won't need to start TRT later on in life unless he has a very new illness or something that causes him to need to take that for a clinical purpose. But if it's something that is just because they, they think it's going to fix them and they think it's going to solve their problem, and they're not diagnosed with any issues that are going to have to do with their luteinizing hormone and their pituitary gland and, and their testes, then TRT is just going to be another quick fix that may give them about a couple of years max of, if they're lucky, of benefits of a noticeable difference, but it's a very short-term fix. That's what I would say for the first for someone who's trying to take TRT is that maybe it will help them at first. And if they started taking it, I wouldn't tell them that it's not going to work because of course it's exogenous hormones. It's going to have an effect on your body. But my first thing I would tell them would be that there is a way for you to do that naturally and for a way, a way for it to last so that you can have higher testosterone that you've had in your, in your past for the past 10, 20 years, possibly you can have similar testosterone to where you're at in your thirties. And when you tell someone that it becomes almost far-fetched because it doesn't seem real. And there are men who've done it. We have guys, you know, like Mike Sager who are in that position where they're able to really optimize their hormones in their seventies. And that's when they really become very successful with hormone balance. But men who have no hope, right? That's a whole different conversation because a lot of men are in that position. Men who are younger have no hope. They have no hope with their relationships. They have no hope with their future. They're in a place of disdain and, and they're just upset with life and their, their health doesn't seem like it's getting any better. There's a lot of different things you can tell that man to start doing, to start trying in order to improve his health, but it all comes from that person's decision. You can tell them all the information they need to know. You can give them every single Huberman lab, bullet points with every single detail of how to optimize their health, but they need to come to a decision. If a man doesn't want to make a decision and be a man in his own health, then, and just wants to take TRT, then that's the decision he makes. If a man wants to make a decision to improve his health and to take time and effort into being able to understand that there is hope, then he has a chance. But until he gets to that point, there's not a single lifestyle change I can give him or something that I can try and force him to do other than giving him the ability to get help, whether if that's through seeing other men his age who have done it before, having testimonials of fellow men who are who have gone through that position, 
it's not going to fear tactics that aren't going to work. Showing how dangerous TRT is isn't going to work for a man who's that hopeful. Well, especially if helpless. the doctor wants to do it, right? The doctor's exactly. all into it. I mean, there's a TRT exactly. clinic like a... right And, there, and, they, and they talk about how great it is because it does have an effect on that. A lot of men have taken TRT, say, it, wow, I feel like I'm in my 20s again. You know, they have that, that boost back and it feels great for them. It's just dangerous what that price is, right? Not only is it the price of will it work long term, but also you're getting out of whack with your body again. Your hormones are getting out of whack. So you have to worry about your heart health. You have to worry about your testicle health. There's other things that are happening behind the scenes that you usually just normally don't think about, but because you're taking something, they could become a possible side effect, which is scary, which could cause a whole different problem and could cause you to be in a whole different world of needing to find different pills and take different things in order to optimize your health. So I think the sense of hope needs to be there because it's going to take work. If you're at 60 and you live the life where now you have 200 testosterone and maybe you're on these different pills and you have a certain type of diet and you're so accustomed to living like this, the best way to go about that, I would say, is to join a community of men who are able to support you in that endeavor and who you can see who've gone through that before and who've been able to come out on the other side. So that's where the best support is as a man is for your fellow brothers and being able to be around those kind of men who are positive influences and who can show you that it's possible is the best way to get hope. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's touch on your supplement stack because, um, you know, and, and, and by supplement, I don't just mean what you eat. I mean, anything that is external to your body, right? So when we do nasal breathing, this is not a supplement because it's like in your body, right? But then I want you to go into your entire day and what sorts of external tools are you using to help bring your health to the next level, to, to bring peace to yourself, to, 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 to have hormonal homeostasis? What are you doing? And I also want you to touch the red light therapy game, what's going on there because I've never used it. I've only heard about it. I've, I've seen the, the ads from different companies. I've never used it, but you have, you know about this. You're a biohacker. You know this very well. Yeah, man, talk about all the external stuff. And of course, you can bring in supplementation that, that you eat as well in that. So I'm talking about things that aren't body related, things that aren't going to be natural and like 100% natural, like through my breath and through my hands, through tapping. There's a lot of value through things like EFT and breath work, of course, but there's also a lot of value that comes from nature, value that comes from your environment. So my protocol is very based on simplicity and I try and do things that I can stick with. And the simplest thing for me first is water, is always looking at the quality of water I drink and the quality of liquids I drink. I make sure to drink liquids that are high in potassium. So I'll drink things that are like coconut water and I will make sure to eat things that are high in potassium like bananas for example but I don't supplement with it I don't have a supplement right now for potassium I just take it naturally through things like sea salt and other minerals mineral rich foods and then that is how I get my potassium intake now that's just something I'm aware of because I know how important potassium is for hormones and I know how potassium works with sodium. People think that too much sodium is bad, but in actuality, you need sodium. And sodium is very important for you. It just depends on how your body is able to process that sodium and use that sodium. Sometimes if sodium, it needs to get into your cells and you have potassium, and you have a lack of potassium, your cells will get attacked by the sodium in order to get in tied to the cells, which causes high blood pressure. So you need potassium to let sodium into the cells. And so tell us about your supplement routine. Um, you were talking about, you started with water. So uh, tell us all about water. What are the minerals in it? And why should we care about the type of water we drink? Water caring is essential. I consider that up there with, with sleeping. If you don't drink clean water and healthy water, you're not going to have 
nearly as much of a benefit as you could if you were to just change your water. I definitely would put it above diet because if you have a really good diet and you're drinking terrible water, you're still going to be dealing with a lot of detriment from the water. Now, how good is good water? That's a little bit too obsessive for me sometimes. Some people are very obsessive about the water they drink. My best method is to just get a, get water with as low total dissolved solids as possible, just as clean as possible, as pure as possible, right? Try not to have it sit in plastic all the time, but obviously, you know, it can't be perfect. Just low TDS, filtered water, so it's just as pure as possible, and then just remineralize it. Just add sea salt and add something like magnesium bicarbonate. Now, magnesium bicarbonate is a little bit more of a difficult topic for people to understand, but it has a very large role in being able to naturally elevate your magnesium levels in homeostasis with the rest of your body. And it doesn't cause disaster pants like something like a magnesium chloride would be doing if you were taking that as a supplement form. And magnesium supplements are usually expensive. So magnesium bicarbonate is the most natural form of magnesium. It's what has been around a lot in our soil. And it's very easy to get um, in a chemical compound. You can make it using milk of magnesia. You can buy powder and make it yourself. It usually requires carbonated water. So it's not easy to make, but it is very efficient. So it's something that you can use for, you know, multiple years and continue to make yourself. Now, water quality is very important. And I also talk about being able to have enough potassium and enough sodium chloride. The potassium is really strong in are really high in things like coconut water and bananas. There's also other foods that have a lot of potassium salts, uh, mineral salts that are high in potassium, which is why I remineralize my water to get that potassium because it's important. If you have too much sodium, not enough potassium, the sodium is going to breach into the cells of your body to give it the sodium it needs. What that's, what that's going to do is increase your blood pressure. And the potassium is going to help balance out your blood pressure. So more potassium. And it tastes good. It has a nice mineral taste to it. Just like the magnesium bicarbonate, it has a nice and minerally taste to it. It's very refreshing and your body craves it. Your body will know when it's getting magnesium or when it's getting potassium because it tastes good. So that's a really cool part of that. That's important to my routine. I'll wake up and I'll make sure I have some kind of hot beverage or beverage that consists of quality water, magnesium bicarbonate. And I'll hydrate myself. I'll make sure I'm getting that as natural as I can for where I'm living. It's never going to be perfect unless I bring my own filtration system with me. So right now I am just drinking whatever I can find best from where I'm at. So I try not to get too obsessed with the water filters because there's a lot of cultishness with water filters and the quality of waters. I personally think that coconut water is filtered by nature. So it's even better. And I love drinking coconut water. So if I can drink that, I would pick that over, you know, mysterious ball of water any day because it is usually unprocessed and unrefined whereas water from the tap is usually very very processed very refined it goes through the pipes so it's high in iron there's just a lot of things you don't want in tap water so if anything just get rid of tap water adding lemon to your water in the morning is something that i haven't done consistently but it does help start your body off for a healthy digestion if you are having gut issues and then I'll start taking my cacao or some hot beverage. Maybe not cacao. I won't do that every day. But I like to have something that is going to be high in polyphenols to give my body a youthfulness, a sense of longevity. And I don't do things for caffeination. I don't drink coffees usually. I usually don't drink a lot of caffeine. The most I'll have is cacao. But when I do consume caffeine, I make sure to wait a little bit after I wake up. So if I were to drink cacao in the morning, I wouldn't drink it right away. I would usually wait and I would spend a little bit of time figuring out what I want to take with my, my um, cacao. I want to make sure I add things to it that are beneficial to me. So I add a little bit of sea salt to that. Some things I've been experimenting with are things for my brain. I like functional mushrooms like reishi mushrooms for calmness, cordyceps for energy, chaga mushrooms for immunity and lion's mane for brain health. I also like taking Bacopa Maneri for brain health and supplements like um, Polygala Tenifolia for brain health that I'm experimenting with. 
that's just my personal routine, my stack right now. I wouldn't recommend this for people because it's just what I've been doing for my own uh, self-experimentation to see what works. And what I've been using to tell if it's working or not is how well I'm at, I am at putting together words and putting together sentences and remembering words and recollection of words is very a telltale for me if I'm my brain's working properly or if it's not. So I'll try and pay attention to that. But when it comes to my routines, I like taking cold showers and ice baths. Those are very easy to me. They're very accessible. They're not easy to do. They don't get any easier over time, but they're fun for me. And when I have the availability, I will choose to do that. For me personally, the ice baths are a lot easier than the cold showers just because it covers your whole body and a shower is more spread apart. So your body doesn't really have time to adapt to it, which may actually be a benefit. But that's what I like to do as a little bio biohack. And that's just because it feels good afterwards. It just feels like very accomplished. Whenever I do that, I just feel good whenever I take a cold shower because I need to shower either way. Hot shower is comfortable during, but I don't feel any different after. I don't feel bad, but I don't feel good. Cold shower feels cool. I just feel like I'm doing something really good for myself and it's on that self-love act. I do the same thing with making breakfast. I'll make breakfast and it usually is very simple. It usually involves eggs, some kind of starch, some kind of vegetable. And when I make breakfast, I do it because I feel good about how I'm treating my body. I'll think about how good the food is for me and how the food is going to fuel my body for the rest of the day and how the fats are going to be able to replenish my body and feed my brain. So that makes me feel good knowing that I'm taking care of myself in that aspect. And then another thing that I like to go and try is trying different herbs. So right now, the only consistency I've been having is taking my Afro D on a daily basis. I take four caps a day and I take, I take them in the capsule form. Usually I will, if I want to feel something, if I want to get a reaction, I will take the Afro D out of the capsules and I will put it in my mouth. Now Afro D is just the four herbs, Talk Adelaide, Hushu, Wu, Pro Powder, Cisandra Berry. And I will take that out of the capsule and I'll taste it in my mouth, I'll masticate it. And that gives me a little bit of an energy boost for the day. I like doing that before the gym. I like doing that in the morning um, on an empty stomach because that's when I feel it the most. But that is something that I go back and forth with. Sometimes I'll do the capsules. Sometimes I will do the actual powder itself. And what I'm really taking it for is because I love adaptogens. I love being able to have a long-term health effect going on in my body, whether it's anti-inflammation, whether it's pro-metabolic, whether it's pro-hormone. I just want to have a healthy effect in my body. And taking those things makes me feel good. So when I feel good, I'm more likely to take positive actions that day in order to improve my health and lifestyle. So that's why I love taking herbs because it just feels so natural and it feels like I'm doing something very good for my body on a cellular level. Now, outside of that, there's a few things I've experimented with, but for the most part, I won't take them unless I need to. There's one thing that I take when I'm trying to focus very hard. I have a lot of work that day and I take carbon 60 and that's something that is a little bit new age sciencey. But that's very interesting because that has an effect on your body's um, ability to improve mitochondrial health. And speaking of mitochondrial health, I also use red light therapy when I'm feeling a little bit discomfortable or have issues or want to make my skin look clearer. I'll use red light therapy on my face, on a part of my body that's in pain, on a part of my body that needs recovery. Like I hurt my ankle or I hurt my knee or I walked a fun way or I'm sore from exercising. That is what I will use, and I'll usually do that throughout the day, depending on where the ailment is and how I'm feeling it. I'll just put it on, and then I'll continue to do whatever I'm doing, if it's reading or working. I like to spend some time in the morning using a, a supplement of, of reading, reading something. Anything that is educational is very beneficial for me because it gets me stimulated in the morning, and it feels good that I'm actually learning something. So that is a fun supplement that is not oral, but is something that I do visually is being able to read a book. So after waking up, getting my water, I will usually get outside, step outside, walk around, exercise, do something in order to honor my body and to enjoy my body. And I won't stress out on forgetting something 
I won't stress out if I didn't take a certain supplement that morning. I won't stress out if I forgot to take a cold shower, whatever it is. Like I don't stress out over those little things. I don't have this relationship with those things that I need to do them every day or my day will be ruined because I can get very obsessive compulsive. And if I get too obsessive, then I'm not going to be able to feel good about what I'm doing every day if I miss something. So I take supplements whenever I'm available to take supplements. The easier the better. And I keep it simple. I like to experiment with things. I don't like to have a whole laundry list of supplements because then I don't know what's causing an effect and what I'm just taking to take. So I like to know what the supplement's doing and actually know what I've taken that day so I can think about it later on and be aware of any changes that are possible for that day. Outside of the mitochondrial health, the red light therapy, the carbon 60, the things that I do not on a day-to-day basis, but every once in a while, I'll also find myself doing things that are more exercise related. I will spend time going out for a walk if I feel called to go for a walk. I'll spend time stretching if I feel called to stretch. I'll listen to my body in that sense. I'll move around. I'll move in my chair. I'll get around. I'll do I'll do things with, with devices. I'll use exercise tools like different floss bands in order to activate those muscles in my body. Sometimes I don't do those things. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I spend a couple of weeks not doing those things. Sometimes I do them every single day. That is more of just honoring what my body's calling for and what is needed. But I learned that sitting a lot is going to cause me to need these supplements more. So if my body isn't in its natural place, in its natural state, these supplements are causing me to have a um, benefit and causing me to take care of myself with the environment that I'm living in, right? Where I'm sitting a lot, where I'm under lights a lot, where I'm not typing on a computer a lot. I need to supplement that because that isn't normal. That isn't, you know, me sa- sca- scavenging through a, through a forest, hunting and gathering for food, right? So I need to take supplements in order to optimize the current living situation that I'm in, the current environment that I live in, the air quality where I'm at, different things that needs to be taken accounted for that I will use. But when it comes to starting my day, I keep it as simple as possible. And I try to avoid getting too lost into supplementation because I have been in that place before and you get almost cultish, right? And then if you forget something, it becomes very upsetting. So that's why I just love to stick with the simple stuff. Coconut water, I have a super great connection with that. So I get a ton of coconut water and quality water. Those are like my two bases right there. If I can get my sea salt and my quality water, I'm good. I'm not going to be upset if I don't get my cacao that day or if I don't take as many supplements as I'm used to. I think that there's a lot of mental masturbation that comes with having a morning routine or having some kind of supplement stack that you take every day and it causes you to have that extra edge. I think that there's something to be said about days where you're traveling or days you're under high stress or days you are doing exercise, intense exercise. You may need to do different things to compensate for that. But on a normal day-to-day basis, finding a way to start your day and not be stressful and be happy and be in the moment and have gratitude is way better than taking a 20-step supplement stack and being stressed out about it the whole time. Very very good point, man. We sometimes get tyrannical and try to be very um, strict and zero flexibility. And I, I, I also agree with you that there's no there's no way that that can help um, in any situation. I think that's uh, that's bad. The one thing you mentioned about sodium and potassium is interesting. So when when there's an action potential in a neuron. Sodium goes into the cell, potassium comes out of the cell. And there is a sodium-potassium pump, which keeps the homeostasis of the sodium and potassium ions inside the cell and around the cell. So this is very interesting. I mean, sodium and potassium are literally instrumental for spiking activity, for literally for your brain cells to activate. You need sodium-potassium to be in homeostasis. So it's such a great thing you, you mentioned about water. And about uh, you know adding the minerals back and and, and get, having as low as uh, total dissolved solids as possible. So this is really cool. I I want to touch on um, as as the last question here is uh, Jameson. We know uh, you know your expertise in gut health and supplements and and um, 
you know, balance, living a balanced life and, and, you know, perennium sunny. And you have a lot of talents and a lot of gifts. And of course, uh, how loving you are and how generous you are with your time and, and your energy. So a lot of gratitude to you. But as a last note, I want to touch on what are the new exciting endeavors or projects that you're a part of? What topic that you are not aware of, perhaps, or you are not well versed in, that you are looking at in the present day. I really like brain health right now. That's my big exciting uncertainty because it's something that I've noticed that I'm dealing with. But I think it's coming down to a lot of simplicity, right? There's a lot of this desire in life to get these different dopamine hits and to get these different excitements out of life. And for me, I'm in a process now where I'm starting to learn about these different habits that I've had over the past 10, 20 years and how they've affected my life now and how my brain works now. So looking at things like social media scrolling and YouTube videos and how consistent that's been in my past, how I use that as a crutch to help me through so many different moments in my life that I think it's super interesting what the ability to focus on coming to good terms with your ego so that you can be happy with where you are in the moment and appreciate the moment versus trying to worry about what's going to happen in the future or what's happened to you in the past. And when I focus on the moment, I find that I'm happier. I have better focus um, with what I'm doing in life. And those projects that I'm focusing on with the brain are all very new to me. They're all very interesting to me and they don't have a lot of, there's still a lot of things that aren't connecting yet. There's still a lot of things that I'm very unsure about and not certain of what's really happening and what the science is behind things and how it's working. But it all comes back to a point of being able to express the, the health. And my biggest question in health has always been, why do people choose to be healthy versus people who don't choose to be healthy? And being able to understand that is very interesting to me because I love helping people who are trying to be healthy. I love being able to provide information and help those people. But I'm looking at my own perspective from health and not other people's. So what I've been doing recently is starting to look at other people's perspective of health. And I am currently looking at health as instead of being a, a feeling of necessity, I think of it as entertainment and it's an experiment of life and looking at health as an experiment and making it enjoyable an experiment where you can really tinker with yourself, not in a sexual way. And it's, <laughs> it adds that level of connection to it, right? It, it allows you to dive into all these different aspects. It's funny when you ask this question, there are so many different aspects that I was con I was interested in like breath work came up and figuring out about how these different movements um, help your body and qigong and dancing and like there's so many different pathways that I'm so interested in right but at the same time my ego is like well what, what can you provide value in like what are you able to you know learn the most about what are you able to provide to others and provide growth in? and it's funny because when that question arises I start to become in a very good place of questioning that question and being able to understand that that is something that is protecting me from putting myself out there in a way that is difficult for me. So right now, my biggest excitements are being able to optimize the Afro-D blend, being able to continue to learn about all the benefits of taking things like Afro-D and being able to take other Chinese medicines and different herbs and how beneficial those are for our body, but also not forgetting the importance of the basis and having conversations with people and meeting people who are not only big health knowledge, but have a, have a sense of entertainment, a sense of play. People who have such a deep sense of play in their life is so intriguing to me. And right now, one of the most exciting things that I feel in life is whenever I meet someone and get to share space with someone and learn from them who is in deep play with themselves, which could be through dancing. It could be through um, their meditations and their breathing. It could be through their qigong. It could be through swinging at playgrounds. Like there's just such a beautiful love that I get from natural, harmonious 
play, childlike play, unadulterated by bringing in exogenous hormones or exogenous um, tools like alcohol. I just love learning about people's natural play and how they can play in a way that is going to improve how they feel and, and teaching them new skills at the same time. And they just are so aligned with that sense of inner child through body movement, through ecstatic dance, through through rhythmic dance, through professional dance, and being able to develop that sense within myself, which for me is is through is through, you know, silliness and entertainment and the full body expression wherever I'm happiest and, and realizing that there's a lot of places where I am happiest and and pursuing those places and sharing those places and having conversations with those around me who've felt that they've been in those places, but by doing other activities, right? So I think that that is my favorite discovery right now that I am currently unfolding and able to really appreciate in the moment instead of trying to worry about what it's going to hold for the future. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Jameson. I mean, the concept of play, I learned the first time I learned it in a sophisticated way was on Jordan Peterson podcast. He talked about Yak Panksap, who is sort of the father of this field of, of play in, chil in, uh, in animals and um, how animals also have, you know, they can get tickled and they, how they play with each other. And it's a very beautiful thing, this play. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, breath work and dance and uh, edutainment and this, but I would say that play can also happen with uh, knowledge and philosophy and religion and politics. A play can happen many, many ways. That's not, it's not oh, yeah. serious. You know, it's, it's. Because for me, it's, it's different. And it's very interesting because I love being around people who have different senses of play. That's what I really like exploring. Right. And being able to appreciate their senses of play right. as well. No, I love that, man. And and as Jordan Peterson says, uh, the the sort of um, antidote to ideology and tyranny and totalitarianism is play. And it's the voluntary voluntarily uh, engaging in play, the voluntary nature of play. It's uh, so such a great... Uh, way to end our podcast today. Thanks so much, Jameson, um, for your time and, and you're very generous and, and a lot of gratitude to you for, um, you know, coming here and, and engaging with the, with the audience and answering all my questions and what a, what a great playful, uh, conversation we had. And, and, and thanks a lot, man. I, I can't wait to hug you in person, uh, very soon. And, um, I, I can't wait for the next podcast, man. Me too, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate you and I appreciate your insights and your questions and your curiosity. Thank you, buddy. See ya.